Hello, people, and welcome to the show. My guest today is a musician. His name is Victor Krauss, and he goes by the name James Game Boy on all the major streaming services. And we talked about uh, a lot of different things. We talked about Kiss, talked about songwriting, talked about the entire Final Fantasy series at the end of the interview. So the last hour and a half is just us talking about Final Fantasy. Talked about politics, all over the place conversation, but um, a really cool chat with a good friend and a great musician. So please, give it up for the great and powerful Victor Krauss. Hell yes. Boom. Podcasting. Victor Krauss, how you doing? We were totally <laughs> not recording before. This is a brand I'm... new podcast. But hey, that's yeah. just, that was just the warm up, man. All that stuff that we thought was recording but isn't recording, man, it's bullshit. The people don't need to hear that. Yeah, that wasn't important. That wasn't important. Man, this is real shit. We're talking about real stuff here. So, <laughs> Victor Krauss, James Game Boy, the legendary musician, first time ever on a podcast with me called The Gred Troyan Show. First yeah. time you've been on The Gred Troyan Show. Certainly haven't been on Ultima Final Fantasy with you and on the Lipstick Panel with you and just, like, being friends. No, this is the first time we're talking. This is real yep. shit, man. And it's crazy. We're going to have such intense chemistry considering that right i mean it's it's so <laughs> weird how we're just hitting it off right away just you know that you've got star power i've got star power just you know <laughs> bouncing off of us yeah it's it's like looking up into the night sky <laughs> before the industrial revolution right so man what jrpgs are you playing right now um i started 10 again just for funsies, and then I, I kind of slowed down once I realized I was going to have to play Blitzball. <laughs> Man, that's like and, that's like the best part. Like, uh, Final Fantasy X really excelled when it was just like a sports drama, and then there's the oh, rest yeah. of the game. <laughs> I, um, I think this time, like, I've played the game right before, where you win the game, and all that stuff goes down, and I think this time, just for the sake of me getting through it, I'm just going to uh, let the cards fall where they may and try not be too intense about it. Because I mostly I mostly just need to show my girlfriend the very good scenes, and I do need to get through the Blitzball scene in order to get to the laughing scene. Right. <laughs> well, so, man, I don't know. That that Blitzball game, like, I, cared about, I care about that Blitzball game way too much each time I play the game, where it's oh, just like... I, yeah, I felt myself like when they were talking about it early on, because when I was playing, I was like, oh, I'll just like, kind of bullshit the football <laughs> game. And then they start talking about it and the, those uh, other players come through and like taunt Waka. And then there's all the shit talking from the announcers at the stadium. Right. It's like, God damn it. I need to win this game. Yeah, no, you, there's there's such de there's such determination at that point to just win that blitz ball game. And like when I played it with Amanda, uh, we went into triple overtime uh, wow. and one in triple overtime. So like that. <laughs> and I just like got up and was just cheering louder than you cheered for the Hulk in Avengers where he said, I'm always <laughs> angry. Like the pure uh, joy and ecstasy at that triple overtime Besaid Aurochs victory. Like, to me, <laughs> I view that as, like, a great moment in sports. Like, that what, triple what overtime the... victory is, is the same as, like, you know, shit, like, you know, the Cavs winning their, you know, first championship in ages. Like, for me, that's just, like, that's a great moment in sports history in my life, that triple overtime victory. <laughs> um, What was the score of that game? I I don't remember what it was. Was it like, was it particularly high? I don't remember. I think it was like 20 to 20 tie. Okay. That's pretty high. Yeah. So I think most of the games I ever played, it would be like three to two. Yeah, no, it was like, it was like a high scoring game and tied and just, and you know, like that first blitz ball game, they make it super difficult for you to win. Cause your team sucks. Yeah. You got to kind of cheese it. Yeah, you got, but it was it was um, we, we, we went hard. We didn't give up. And um, I think what <laughs> you, what I ended up doing you didn't to play your best, you played to win. Yeah, I played to win. I think what I ended up doing was um, I scored a point and then just hid behind my goal because there's like a glitch where they won't chase you behind the goal. <laughs> and they just like were just hanging out there and then we just ran out the clock. But we won in triple overtime. 
It was beautiful. It was beautiful. <laughs> Sent those Kilika bastards. Uh, wait, was it Kilika or Luka? No, it was the Luka goers. Yeah, fuck those yeah, guys. Yeah, the Luka goers. Because they beat the they beat the Albed right. in the first round without you. Right. Man, isn't this weird how it's like, this is like a, a sports conversation, but we're just talking about a JRPG. <laughs> yeah. But this is how, how like people who sports all the time must feel. They're just like, yeah, like when that team won, it was so great, man. <laughs> well, and they didn't even participate like we did. We're yeah. like actual athletes. <laughs> right, we're actual. <laughs> we're... But, you know, I mean, really, like... You know, Titus is just the the Michael Jordan of that world. So really, yeah. Final Fantasy X is just Space Jam. Pretty much, it's not it's not far off. He comes from a a distant land, although distant in a different dimension. And he's like, I can't believe where I am. All of these people are weird, and they want me to play sports with them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I don't I don't see any difference. I I really feel like Warner Brothers should be uh, suing for plagiarism for, for Square. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they need to, to make it up for them with their own version of uh, Kingdom Hearts with the characters that Warner Brothers have rights to. Oh, now there's a game, folks. So Sora goes into uh, the Matrix with Keanu. Uh, yeah. And, goes well, and teams up with yeah, Batfleck. Like, Batfleck well, doesn't like have a heart. The, uh, it's like he's a the heartless. Lego Batman movie, essentially. Yes. Well, yes. All the, <laughs> I, and I... Man, wasn't that so great where you just knew, like, oh, these are the characters they have rights to. Oh, yeah. Sauron and Voldemort. <laughs> these and... Warner Brothers-specific <laughs> characters. <laughs> they, you know, they did it up right. I mean, Lego Batman was a, was a great movie. I've actually got um, a bunch of... Um, I realize I have all the Batman theatrical released films except for Justice League and Lego Batman. So I'm going to do a ranking video of the Batman films for my channel. <laughs> nice. Yeah, but I've, I mean, I've seen all of them. Justice League is definitely at the bottom because it has the Cardinal sin of just being boring. Yeah. Which is definitely. like, it's, it's a bummer because like everyone is good. Like it's not that the actors are bad at their roles. Like everyone's actually pretty damn good. It's just the movie is boring. <laughs> The, the yeah, struggle is the real. Snyder cut. It's coming, um, man. It's coming. It's... <laughs> I, I do edge to reps every day for the Snyder cut. <laughs> just I, I, you know, I'm like, I'm feeling done. I'm feeling tired. Like, you know what? Just one more rep. One more rep for the Snyder cut, bro. For the Snyder cut. Um, did you see he's uh he's he's uh cutting Crystalia out of his new movie? Who's that? Uh, Crystalia got canceled recently. He's the guy who's not that funny. Who's oh. famous? Uh, uh, but he was in the Zack Snyder movie, and then he got canceled, and now it's going to be Tignataro instead. Who, who, um, what did he do to get canceled? I assume a joke. Uh, uh, kind of being a pervert oh, for okay. underage girls. You know, that's so he's a libertarian. <laughs> yeah, he's sort of a libertarian about it. So, not unlike Elsa, right? Not unlike Elsa. So I love um. <laughs> I came to a great realization that libertarian uh, foreign policy and libertarian domestic policy is the exact same thing. Okay. Which is, what if we just, like, don't do anything? Not a single thing. <laughs> Not a single thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, genius. This guy should be president. He, he gets it. If we just do nothing, everything will be fixed. <laughs> yeah. If you just stop doing things. <laughs> That is um, that is one of your um, one of the things that we've talked about that often cycles through my head between that and uh, your revelation about Vinnie Vincent on the um, uh, the Speedball Jam episode. What was the revelation about Vinnie Vincent? That he can be a good songwriter and write something like Lick It Up and then also turn around and then just shred for like an hour and a half straight and be like, but isn't this awesome? <laughs> <laughs> I think you and I have a very similar perspective on just the concept of reality being terrifying, but also hilarious <laughs> simultaneously. And just like, oh, well, I guess I'm just going to laugh at how stupid reality is. Yeah, they're like, uh, we've been getting things around here recently, like not where I live, but like in Portland and a couple other cities here in Oregon. They're like picking up mailboxes and taking them away. <laughs> 
which is just like I this is just so out in the open at this point. <laughs> what are you what are you even doing? <laughs> uh, I don't I don't understand people, man. <sighs> the the really good one though is I saw somebody who was like they saw some MAGA idiots like trying to take down a post office box and they couldn't quite get it out of the ground, so they just stood around it and wouldn't let anybody mail anything. Which I thought was really good. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just <laughs> oh, just my, my my mind is just really just I'm I'm having tr- I'm having trouble, Victor. <laughs> I'm having trouble with humans, like. <laughs> uh, so, like, have you also been really trolled when like? Anyone on the left is acting excited about a Kamala Harris VP pick as opposed to just oh. like begrudging acceptance of just like, fine, I guess. But like, I've seen people just like, man, this is great. This is the best case scenario. And I'm just like, uh, really? Is this really the best case scenario? I, <laughs> we, <laughs> there is like, there's not really such a thing as a best case scenario anymore. I mean, like no, that, there, there, that just doesn't even exist. No, there is. It's all of a sudden like Tulsi and Yang uh, defect. Like, you know what? Third party. And then everyone votes for them. That's like Shit. a best case scenario. <laughs> there is but an even, at. Even that isn't that good. I mean, it's. It, hey, it's a, it's a hell of a lot better. And look, I think. I mean, I think honestly, if you had a President Tulsi in the like if i had to pick like of all the candidates who i think is best specifically for dealing with covid i would say tulsi would be like number one of the list i, I think see that i guess i think andrew yang i would prefer him like overall but i'm just like hey who would i want like at the helm right now and like who i think would actually accomplish like getting shit done like, for me, it's Tulsi because she does believe in UBI, but she also, like, has, like, the strong military background and, like, the strong, like, leadership capabilities where she's just like, hey, uh, this sucks, but, you know, we're going to buck her down and do this together uh, because she's a military person but also anti-war, which I think is, like, it's, that's a good combo to have. <laughs> like, someone who's like, I will be tough, but I prefer not to just go and kill people. Like, I think that's, like, that's that's the that's what you want. Like, someone who's tough but, like isn't ready to jump at war at the first chance they get. Because, like, we don't, ha- we don't have an anti-war party anymore, bro. It's like, you have, you know, the corporatists who like Disney and the corporatists who like Warner Brothers. <laughs> you know? <Yeah. laughs> That's what it is. It's Disney versus Warner Brothers. Dems versus Republicans. Yeah, except that... Except, you know, Warner Brothers also likes the Democrats. And it's also, like... Even Disney and Warner Brothers have more challengers. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, that doesn't enco- encompass that entire industry at all. It, mm. it gets pretty close, but it's, there's, there's other people involved. You know, there's a part of me that's, like, worried about Disney becoming more and more of a monopoly. But then there's the part of me that becomes more and more satisfied with the product they release. So I'm just like, how upset can I be when, like, your monopoly is better than competition? That well, see, that's where our roads diverge. I well, and the main thing here is that now I'm at a point where I just don't, I don't like any movies. I I only I like like 15 movies, and a lot of them have Keanu Reeves or Patrick Swayze. In them. <laughs> uh, man, I was um, I was trying to come up with like a list because you know they were having that like 50 film challenge. Yeah, and I was trying to come with a with a list of those. And once I get past, like, the top 25, it's more just like, yeah, I like these. These are fine. Um, but I'm not, like, you know, as, like, gun ho passionate. But it's like, oh, man, these are my absolute favorites. Like, these are ones I'm pretty sure I like more than all other films in existence. But, you know, I could remember something else and forget about it. So, you know, that's the trick when, like, you're not necessarily a film guy. Um you know, as I'm working on breaking into that industry, because <laughs> the music industry is dead. <laughs> I, I, so I was a, a film major in college and I attempted to be a film guy for a long time. And I think I was pretty good at it. In fact, my, uh, my professor, I ran into my film professor the other day cause I still live near my college. 
And he was like, yeah, it, if we end up doing screenings at school, which not optimistic, right. but he was like, we might have to break it into smaller groups and I might need you to like <laughs> be in charge of one of them. You're getting paid, right? <laughs> I have no idea. Hopefully that would be pretty rad. Um, and it's especially good because now I live closer to where that would be happening than I ever did while I was attending school. Um, but I, it's just like, there are a couple of good movies. Keanu Reeves is in a lot of them. <laughs> Patrick Swayze is in the others. Right. Um, well, I think it's but, because film is a, a really limited, um, medium because you, d- yeah, this, despite containing like almost every art form, <laughs> it is just so there's so little, uh, well, not so little to it, but like just, it's the time constraints. It, it's yeah. how good of a story can you tell in time constraints? And that's like the biggest difficulty I'm finding. Cause as I'm, um, I'm writing two screenplays simultaneously. One is, um, sort of like an indie drama because you know how just like film festivals and stuff eat that shit up and it costs no money to make. And just like, it's yeah, dialogue. It's dialogue heavy totally because it's artistic choice and not just because we can't afford anything else. You know, dialogue heavy working class drama. Um, but it's, um, that one is like largely a vehicle for a local musician friend of mine who like I know can get the funding to just make that be a thing. And oh, so nice. if I'm just like, hey, I wrote you a vehicle, and they're like, oh, sweet. Well, I will just make this be a thing. And then I just, like, get a screenwriting credit and don't have to do anything beyond just that. Um, yeah. And so then it's just like, oh, like, there's this cool indie drama. This guy wrote this thing. So I've got that one, and I'm also doing the uh, the Journey to the West musical, which I'm, you know, pitching to the big mouse once it's done through my connections yeah. there. So that's going to be uh, – and that one, I've got the entire like plot, like scene by scene done. But man, it's so hard to write a good story when you have to do it in like an hour and a half. Yeah. Well, plus, I mean, did you watch the Stephen Chow version? Uh, n- well, that I, I saw it existed, <laughs> and then I saw it was like sort of like, oh, but it's them in modern times. So I'm like, oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, and and what I'm doing is I'm reading the book. Also, it's just way too hot in here. I gotta no. I gotta get down to a hey, normal looking shirt. Plug that plug that podcast. <laughs> oh, the you talking you two to me? Yeah, it's, got, it's coming coming right at you. Here, <laughs> it, I bring it up on every episode of Lipstick I'm on, so I might as well bring it up here too. Right? I mean, I still have not listened to a single episode. I should bring them on this <laughs> show and just be like, I haven't listened to your show, but one of my guests talks about you all the time. You guys are good. <laughs> I I I have no idea how you would react to that show. I think. Well, I also don't really know how you feel about you two. Uh, very positive. They're a very good band. Okay, um, so that's a that's a good thing. I mean, I'm not an idiot. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you two is a good band. I'm not um obsessed with them, uh, but I would say they have a strong catalog. Uh, you know, great songwriters. I don't really have any real complaints with you two. Uh, I know it's also been like 40 years of four guys, which is pretty incredible. Yeah. I mean, I, I have no, I have no beef with you two. They're, they're a good band. Um, yeah, I, I, nothing, nothing bad to say really. Like some people are like, well, Bono is kind of an asshole. And then they never really explain why Bono is kind of an asshole. They're just like, I just don't (laughs) like him. I'm like, okay, do you have something specific? Well, he just seems kind of snobbish. What has he done that's snobbish? Uh, 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 and then they don't have anything to say. <laughs> so, like, if you can just, like, give me specific reasons why you think Bono is now so, like, he's always talking about, like, feeding kids in Africa. Like, oh, man, what a dick. <laughs> <laughs> what a terrible person wanting to, like, help people who were born on the wrong slab of dirt and suffer because of it. Jeez. Why couldn't... <laughs> Why couldn't we get libertarian Bono? <laughs> right. Why couldn't Bono just say, hey, kids in Africa, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. <laughs> if you were just like me, you know, a white person smoking weed, you know, <laughs> telling other people to work hard, everything would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I think the only th- issue I have with you two is that they're more popular than Thin Lizzy. 
Like you that's know, that's my only beef I could, with that. I could see that. I could see that being a bone you have to pick. We're just like, <laughs> oh man, like U2 is the only good band from Ireland. So like when people say that, I'm like, yo, dog, hold up, I'm gonna let you finish. But Thin Lizzy has one of the best catalogs of all time, <laughs> all time. <laughs> yeah, so that's that. You know, that's how I feel. I feel like. I feel like Thin Lizzy deserved the success that U2 got, but I'm not, like, upset with U2 for being successful. I just think their levels of success should have been reversed, where U2 should be, like, the band that hardcore music fans are super into, and Thin Lizzy should be, like, the massive phenomenon that, like, is shoved down your throat whether you want it or not. <laughs> like, that that's I... how I feel. <laughs> I think, um... I, I wish people were a little more like, like it would be perhaps more annoying than people saying they just suck, which they don't. But I wish that there were people like, oh, they used to be good. Like the first three albums were good or something. Cause those are, I mean, those are, those war, are amazing. Like those are war I think is like is a top 10 album for me. I mean, and, that's, that's very fair. Like it's not a top 10 album for me. But it's not a kind of top ten album where I'm just like, "What? You're full of shit." I'm like, "No, War is a is a is an absolute masterpiece." Like, I'd say probably their magnum opus. Yeah, it's. I think it's their. I I think regardless of like what where what era you fall in on them, I think it is their best album in terms of like quality of each song. Yeah, is at such a high level, and it doesn't have any like. It doesn't have any losers on it. Yeah, and just really just killer performances. Like the 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 drumming on that album is just fan friggin' tastic all the way through. Where like that's almost like the star of the album is just how great the drumming is. But it's not like um you know, like when Rush fans are only listening to the drumming and ignoring good songs. Like there's <laughs> you know, the drumming is the star of those songs for me, but they're like they're just so well written. It's just it's 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 a killer record. I have once again zero complaints with that one. <laughs> you know, my only complaint is that it's more popular than, you know, Jailbreaker Johnny the Fox. That's my only complaint. <laughs> Johnny the Fox. Although it's Jimmy the Wee. Although there's there's a couple I, I would say being unbiased, you know, War is a stronger album than Johnny the Fox. Um <laughs> The best Being song... biased, I would say that as well. Yeah, but but, <laughs> but I think uh, that's because there are a couple of songs on Johnny the Fox that are just like, you know, Thin Lizzy being like, you know what, we're gonna re- not make these, you know, S rank songs. We'll just have a couple A plus songs so that you two can have one album that's better than us. Yeah, I mean, and you know, they were throwing them a bone. Honestly, that's that speaks. To it was the, very considerate. Uh, the of them. empathy, the empathy found in Phil Phil Linet's, uh in his oeuvre. I mean, that's just, you know, what a good guy, <laughs> what a good dude he was. He's like, you know what? There's going to be another band from Ireland and they're not going to be as good at us. So I'm going to write a song that's, you know, solid, but like, you know, not as great as most of our stuff. So like, you know, I'm going to write borderline. It's going to be really good. It would be other <laughs> bands best song, but for us, you know, it's sort of middle of the road. <laughs> I'll stick a couple of those kind of songs in them just to go easy on them. But I'm still going to put on Massacre because, fuck, we got to have, you know, some, you know, Stone Cold classics. You know, and then, Lizzie, we can't not be awesome. And then because Victor is going to listen to both bands eventually, I will put Sweet Marie on here as well. I mean, uh, Sweet Marie <laughs> is, a, is a song I put more in the, like, oh, we weren't trying that hard category. <laughs> <laughs> and that's you know, why it's so good. <laughs> this is Hey, this is something I, you know, this might have been in the uh, part that got cut. That might have been a... Uh, a thing that they thought of and kind of threw down and then maybe forgot to refine, but it was already pretty good. It's like when you, it's like when you're making like a grilled cheese sandwich and then there's like maybe sort of half a face of a celebrity on one side. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I, I see. I see what you're saying. I'm, I'm smelling. It's what, not, it's not quite, it's not what you're grilling. carving. It's, it's not quite carving David out of, uh, out of marble, but <laughs> it's, you know, it's you know getting the Virgin Mary on a on a piece of grilled cheese. No, I get that. Um, and for people who are wondering, we so we uh, we had some issues uh, recording at the start because tech issues. Man, tech issues and podcasts they just go together so well every <laughs> single time. But uh, we were talking about uh, the approach of songwriting, and my approach is typically hear like a major hook in my head, come with the concept for the song, 
and then um, like get the raw stuff down on paper first, step away a little bit, and then refine. Uh, so you like you approach it with the emotional part first, and then the intellectual, so that way uh, you get sort of the best of both worlds. And um, Victor's approach on his first album was kind of the same thing, where he would hear it in his head and then go back and write it. Uh, but you know, I relate to writing songs at work uh, alone off Lipstick One. Uh, that was written uh, while I was working at Steak and Shake, making milkshakes. <laughs> well, and it was it's because you had a vision of the future of someone trying to defend Reveal <laughs> on a podcast. Right. And I'm like, I need to make sure that I have the song ready when someone wants to re <laughs> defend Reveal on a podcast. Which, by the way, did you listen to my uh, R.E.M. Um, monster on Patreon? I have it open and I was going to listen to it. And then I was like, oh, Julia and I should listen to it to it together and we just haven't sat down and done it yet yeah i mean uh, i i, I cause after we're each trying song to, is when i comment so we're trying we're trying to figure out a night when we can like when it will be okay for us to be really mad ah uh, <laughs> i mean yeah uh I, that's probably my least favorite rem album uh is monster Thus far. yeah yeah I that's think... so funny i mean that doesn't well yeah i knew it was it was going to be a big swing either way i think well, it's just like I think the songs weren't as good. Like it's it's not that I'm against like what they were doing conceptually. It's just like oh, you just didn't write as good of songs this time around. Like ah, oh, geez, like you're still not writing good songs and it's still going. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that was my like because I think reveal. I, I know a lot of people are like ragging because like oh, it's too mellow. But like yeah, but every one of these mellow songs is a banger. It's a very mellow, <laughs> quiet banger, but it's still a banger. <laughs> I, I think with Monster, it's I will say the first time I heard Monster, I hated it. And now and it was it's, my first listen. So it's like, hey, yeah, <laughs> it's so can you really be mad at of, me for having your same first impression? Like, wow, this sucks. No, you're supposed to you're supposed to be more musically competent than me. You're supposed to understand these things and be like three or four steps ahead. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that how you view me? No, I I mostly am just like you've heard a lot more music than me, so I'm just kind of like, well, maybe he'll maybe he'll understand it faster. <laughs> I think I probably understood it faster, but I still wasn't very impressed. But it's like <laughs> I think just because like I've seen them do better on like both sides, like prior to that and after that, and yeah. so it's just like it it just felt. You know, I understand they were just like not like in a happy mood when making it. And just, like, maybe weren't, like, as... Didn't have the passion and fire uh, to write really, really metal song, mellow songs and have Joey in another studio across the street. Yeah. but Which, uh, I mean, they they got there, though. Yeah, they got so there. So that's what's important. Uh, would, would Like and Reveal More Than Monster be a hot take in the R.E.M. community? Yes, but it's one that I share. Uh, well, I'm sorry that you and I are just <laughs> right about music. <laughs> You know, REM fans just need to accept the tr uh, reveal is a great album. Like I, yeah, <laughs> I, you know, the, the other people aren't around to, to shit on it. Like I can just agree with you that it's great. Like I have, like that's another album I have no complaints with, or like very minor complaints with. Well, that's yeah, that's crazy because I have complaints with it. <laughs> I, I just, uh, I think the highs are so high. It's the uh, highs it's, are so summer turns to high. Yeah, and I've been as well <laughs> uh it like it's it's their dynasty you know <laughs> yeah there we go we're, we're bringing in the kiss fans man you now know the now, kiss catalog now that i kind of know the kiss catalog you, I, you do you've listened to them more than steve has because you've listened to them more than once that's true i'm well let me look let me look at my list here I, so what I did was I went through once the entire catalog and kind of ranked as I went. Mm -hmm. And then this time I started at the bottom oh. and I'm working my way up. So and making sure making sure that each album is better than the one I just heard, essentially. Got it. So where are you at now? Like what number? Um, I just listened to one that frankly dropped quite a bit. Uh, but I think I have 11 of them left. So what uh, what dropped quite a bit after you revisited it? Hot in the Shade. Hot in the Shade? Man. I think Hot in the Shade is half a really good album. Ah, See, I think Hot in the Shade has uh, has 14 uh, really good songs and, uh, and Boomerang. 
<laughs> I but, think Hot in the Shade probably has three really good songs and they, a couple kind of good songs. Are, are they the singles? Um. Well, let me. Now you're gonna make me I mean, back up. My I, claim. I mean, I can, I can just. Here we go. Uh, what are the three really good songs in Hot in the Shade? The three really good songs are Forever. Okay. Which I did not like initially, and I have warmed to it considerably. I didn't like it the first time I heard it either. Uh, I think like the production was so '80s and like so much reverb, where like some, the the greatness of the writing got a little bit lost in the production. Um, but then when you revisit, and just like man, what a killer vocal performance! My favorite <laughs> guitar solo ever, and just hooks galore. Um, like I, for for me, like that's a song that I think is really great and just like might might take a couple of listens to get used to the production, but I'd say a masterpiece. Uh, so what are the other two? Uh, Silver Spoon. Them female backing vocals. I think Silver Spoon might be a top ten Kiss song. For oh me. damn! Because it's one that like when I saw the title coming up again when I was listening to it this morning, I was like, oh, that's one that I like a lot. And then it started playing, and I was like, I was correct <laughs> to think that. <laughs> And then, um, and then what's and the then, third? Maybe there was only two that I really love. I rem- I like King of Hearts too. Yeah, because I'll, it rem- it I'll reminds me Kingdom- of Sticks. Oh, it also reminds me of Kingdom Hearts because I would grind yeah. to that song. It's it, uh, well, you know, it it works out great. It's two things that I like more than Kiss. Man, when you when you grind, <laughs> I'm telling you, Hot in the Shade is great grinding when you're like in uh, Traverse Town early in the game. You just oh, yeah. put on Han the Shade and like do some battles there. I'm telling you, it <laughs> is the perfect grinding music for Traverse Town. <laughs> just you, you know, you'd think, oh, you'd want to play it in um freaking uh, Destiny Islands, but no, like you're not grinding on Destiny Islands. No, you're grinding well, in Traverse Town. Well, you'd think you'd want to do it in um, Alice in Wonderland, right? Because of King of Hearts, right? <laughs> yeah, you'd you'd think, but no, it's actually. Traverse Town, when you're just like, you know, I want to do some grinding before I start hitting up these Disney worlds. I want to, you know, bulk up, get ripped. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 great for that. But I think also, like, I have um, I have a soft spot for like that like late '80s, early '90s era of hair metal, okay. where like there's just um the production got cleaned up and everyone was just totally fine with pop hooks, and also that was. A point where like a lot of those bands were starting to get cleaned up, not doing heroin, so everyone was working out. So like, <laughs> everyone was ripped, looking good, um, like wearing basketball jerseys and like high fiving on the beach, talking about believing in yourself, and like like putting were, sunglasses on put, a sphinx. Yeah, like that was like like everyone was just feeling really good in that time, and just like that fashion sense and that like style just like really works for me. And also just, like, how good Paul's voice is on that album and how Gene, like, wrote, like, decent melodies with, like, really stupid lyrics. But that's like, hey, he's back. <laughs> he's back to the, the quality we expect from Gene. So I mean, that, <laughs> that one I have a soft spot for. But also it might just be all the Kingdom Hearts grinding. I, I could see that. I think I honestly I dropped it, like, eight or nine spots and then once – forever and silver spoon kind of came in i was like okay so this this album isn't horrible it's just a little uneven oh so i think because so you don't listen to lyrics you don't realize how great hide your heart is yeah (laughs) (laughs) ah you don't like hide your heart ah you're breaking my heart i mostly just don't remember it it's ah 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 Hey, oh, hey, it's that do, one. Do, 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 that's do, the do. one. So that's the one that makes me think of uh, Limousine. And that's only because I heard Limousine before I heard Kiss. Yeah, well, you know, Limousine is one of Kiss's primary influences. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Kiss has you know, said, you know, without Limousine, we'd be nowhere. They've talked multiple times about doing a Limousine tribute album uh, because Which, so many of their songs were just inspired by Limousine. Yeah, they, too, aspire to have hearts of lions and wings of bats. Because I mean, it's midnight. I mean, don't we all? Yeah. I mean, Limousine is kind of like the Velvet Underground of the 2000s. Like, not very many people saw Limousine, but everyone who did... Uh, That's really cool about it. Yeah. That's <laughs> really freaking smug. <laughs> <laughs> N- 
no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of getting... Oh, also, oh, um, read my body is just pour some sugar on me. Uh, no, read my body is pour some sugar on me if it was a rap. Oh, shit! <laughs> <laughs> no, man, read my body is, um, an absolute masterpiece with that, like, Latin, like, drum machine loop. That is so freaking <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Like, uh, I think Paul Stanley said, like, Tone Loke was the inspiration for that. Yeah, that's really good. Like, I, no, that's I, I, good stuff. I love Read My Body. That's a freaking, like, ah, man, Kiss makes me laugh. They are, <laughs> I, I get a good chuckle out of Kiss music. Like, if you're taking Kiss music <laughs> completely seriously, I think you're doing it wrong. Well, I mean, ha- hair metal fans, you know, they're all about the lyrical content of the music. They are, and the thing is... I've heard some hair metal fans say, I can't take Read My Body seriously because the lyrics are so goofy. And I'm like, <laughs> dog, you're listening to hair metal. Do you remember what genre of music you're listening to? But, but like, pour some sugar on me is really cool. Like, wh- what, are you even, what are you even talking about? What are, you, what are you doing? Like, you can say that I think that um, pour some sugar on me has better hooks, which is a very legitimate case to make. But... Uh, Say, like, oh, man, these hair metal lyrics... Are, like, I understand there's a spectrum. And I understand that, like, there's stuff that's too far where, you know... The new Cardi B single are lyrics where I'm just like... Even as a guy who listened to hair metal, I'm like... You went a little bit far in how <laughs> silly these lyrics are. So, like, there is a spectrum, I, but... Um, I prefer I prefer the Ben Shapiro version. I mean, uh... Just uh, classed up just a little bit. The Ben Shapiro <laughs> version, like... Because I, I reacted to that song, and my... I was just, like, not generally impressed with it from a musical standpoint. But then when he tried to, like... I mean, what Ben Shapiro did just proved he was a terrible lay. Is just... uh, (laughs) And just, like, you know, confirmed what we all suspected, that he's not good in the sack. Which is, like, you know, you just kind of figured. But that was, like, the confirmation. Yeah, there's... There had been been flutters in the wind about this for a long time. (laughs) People have been saying it. Yeah, like, look, it's possible to be, like... I don't like the song or I think that it is so vulgar and crass that it just comes off as stupid without any semblance of cleverness. Like you can, you can say that as like an artistic critique, but what he did was like questioning if that happens to women. (laughs) And it's like, (laughs) yo dog. (laughs) (sighs) I I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, It just, it was, it was. You gotta. It was really. You gotta beat her body, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that, that's painful to think about. We gotta move on to something less painful. Uh, all right, Final <laughs> Fantasy One. Less painful. <laughs> we're doing it. We're, yeah. we're, we're We're finally talking about Final Fantasy for once. He, the thing can that. Throw, he, yeah. Like, cause that's nice. like how our friendship started. Where I'm just, I heard this guy in a Final Fantasy podcast. I'm like, this guy is more charming than the hosts. I should have him <laughs> on. <laughs> Which actual um, recent both um, both Final Fantasy related, uh, UFF related, and music related, um, I get to be Dave Ellefson on the next uh, Megadeth cover. Oh, nice! I just recorded that last night. Nice, cool. So, so it was a good time. The next time they release an episode uh, next year, it'll be ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He he said he's mixing it hopefully this weekend. So, well, the song might be ready long before, uh, long before any episodes come out, or they might just drop it in the feed. Yeah, they they they'll pr- I, man, I have I have no idea. I mean, um, it's it's weird. Like at this point, Joe doesn't really talk to me, but Caleb does. Uh, oh really? <laughs> yeah, no, they like they go back and forth between which one of them actually decides to communicate with me. Um, That's funny. I think Cal- I don't know if I've ever talked to Caleb outside of a message group that has Joe in it. No, like Caleb messages me privately. I think what it comes down to is I think that like Caleb actually likes me. I don't think Joe <laughs> actually likes me, but he views me as like useful to keep around. <laughs> but, which, you know, is probably like the highest compliment you can take if someone's like this person annoys me, but not enough where I realize I can't get stuff out of them. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's not nothing. Yeah, it's not because I, I think like he realizes that like I did a, a good job with the film score in terms of like the amount of music I made in the amount of time I was given and like the quality of the product. 
So even though like my personality might grate on him, he's like, ah, yeah, I should keep him around in case I need him for another gig. <laughs> well, that that's another thing. I'm another person who's vaguely related to 13th Cross that you brought on before Joe. Oh, that's that's true. Well, you know, you you did uh you did do the uh, the the film score, and you know, I think he's maybe just like pissy because like I you know, was just making jokes about movies he liked and just took it way too seriously. Like, yeah. no, you can't joke about movies, man. Movies are serious. Yeah. And I'm just like, I, I feel like... Which I think that's part of what exhausted me about being a film person. Yeah, like, I think... I, I really like when a movie is, is bad. I only like bad do I. movies now. Well, Which is I... honestly, honestly, that really opened me up to getting into the Kiss catalog. <laughs> that definitely like, that helped. sounds like a joke, but it honestly helped. <laughs> well, I think there's there's certain like I think there's a certain thing where just some people like can't laugh at things they like and and can't like uh tear down their sacred cows. So like I I love Frozen, but I can like make jokes about it and like structurally point out flaws with it but still enjoy it. Yeah. Um or with Kiss or even with Thin Lizzy where I can like Make fun of like, yeah, and here's Phil talking about the potato famine. How freaking hilarious is that? <laughs> so, like, you should be able to find the comedy and flaws and things that you love. Be able to look at, like, something that's over-the-top serious and doesn't land and be able to, like, have a chuckle about it. Um, Which reminds me, um, a movie that very much entered uh, a kind of a, a space that I can enjoy a movie in. Uh, have you seen Xanadu? I know the soundtrack. Uh, I've never actually gotten around to watch the movie. I've seen like clips. You know, I, Olivia Newton-John, roller skating, oh, yeah. electric light orchestra. Um, I mean, I, the soundtrack I, is banging. That is like that's a killer. I, I soundtrack. think that's a that's a movie. I think uh, you and I might jive with. There's... Oh no, that definitely seems my speed. Like all those like really like bad rock movies from like the '60s and '70s, like uh, Kiss meets the Phantom of the Park. All those Beatles movies, like Help, uh, freaking Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. <laughs> like, I guarantee you, if I watch Xanadu, I'd be like, this movie is great, and I'm having an awesome time. It's, there, there's just a kind of movie that's good, and then there's every other movie. Like, to, <laughs> tonight, tonight, uh, after Julia gets off work, we're going to go over to, actually, the same friend who we watched Xanadu with, and we're going to watch Roadhouse, which is just... One of my favorite movies. I've ever. actually never seen Roadhouse. I know Roadhouse. it mainly for the soundtrack, which is, I feel also like, good. yeah, it's a killer soundtrack. I I think well because you I would love, probably love you it. love yourself a Stallone movie. I think Patrick Swayze is admittedly not Sylvester Stallone. They're very different, mm. but they they come from a a similar. T well, no, Stallone's a lot earlier, but I think a lot of what people kind of associate with Stallone was kind of happening around the time that Roadhouse came out. Yeah, no, I, I guarantee you I would probably love Roadhouse because I've seen clips from it. I know generally what happens, like he's going to rip out a rapist's throat and stuff like that. Uh, it's, so it's a great movie. <laughs> I guarantee you if I actually sit down and watch Roadhouse, I will probably love it. And it's not like, because, uh, you know, sometimes I'm like a bad judge of a movie as to whether or not I'll love it where I'll go in thinking it'll be great and then it really disappoints me. Um, or I'll go in and think that it's going to be uh, terrible and then it blows me away. So, like, Taxi Driver, I thought was going to be awesome and blow me away. I'm like, oh, I don't like this at all. Um, <laughs> Taxi Driver's a bummer, though. <laughs> I mean, Taxi Driver is just like, I, I watched the entire thing, like, so what was the point? <laughs> like, all right, you're like, you're kind of awkward. I mean, I guess you could just learn how to socialize like a normal person. Uh, the end. So if just like he just like develops some social skills, there's no movie. Um, uh, so Taxi Driver, I thought was a bit disappointing because I was expecting it to be great and I didn't like it. And then Your Name, I thought was going to be a trash movie and then ended up being one of the greatest films I've ever seen. And I was like, Oh yeah, Your Name was a was a really very heartfelt, emotional thing that has. I have some issues with it, but I would say over on the whole, that is a great movie. I would say on the whole, like the thing is the very first scene of that movie. I thought, oh, Jesus, this movie is going to suck because yeah, the first so did I. <laughs> Cause the first scene is just like, just like the character be like, what? I'm in a girl's body. I guess I'm going to touch these boobs. And I thought, oh, Jesus, is it going to be one of these kind of movies? And then it ended I... up being so good in spite of that terrible, terrible beginning. 
I think ultimately it, that was the right decision. You just get that shit right out of the way. Right. <laughs> and then you get into the movie. I mean, yeah, no, it ultimately was, but like I was, I was so trolled by it. I'm just like, and like, I refuse to believe people who said it was a good movie. I'm like, no, no, this is <laughs> just anime fans animating it up as they want to do. <laughs> And then it was, it was. I mean, I would say it's probably my favorite romance film of all time, with the only competition being the 1939 Wuthering Heights and Rocky one. <laughs> well, because you haven't seen Roadhouse. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Oh, and Rocky three. <laughs> you know, one of the great romance yeah. films of all time. I mean, it's it's hard to top uh, Rocky and Apollo frolicking in the surf, hugging each other. <laughs> Great moment in cinema history. But no, like, Roadhouse is a movie I would love. The thing is, I'm having a lot of trouble with time management lately. Oh, totally. Where, like, I'm not one of those people who, like, COVID hit. I'm like, I guess I'll, what am I going to do with all my time? It's like, I've been I've been working out every day, which eats up time been writing every day with each up time and like still like working like a full-time job like you know like i don't really have time to just sit and watch a movie unless it's with the wife like yeah. she wants to watch a movie and she doesn't want to watch roadhouse like there's a very like specific set of movies that like we can watch <laughs> together like that meet both of our tastes um well she's she's a choreographer right she is a choreographer former choreographer there, you know there's there's uh there's stuff to look at in that movie choreography wise. <laughs> uh, choreography happens objectively. There is choreography that happens. Like like I said, I've seen clips. I know what I'm getting into, and like I love like cheesy action movies with quippy one-liners and really charismatic stars, like <laughs> and like bitchin' soundtracks. Like I guarantee you, like Roadhouse. I expect if it's if it, if I don't love it, I will at least have a lot of fun with it and say, yeah, it was pretty good. Like, I don't expect going, leaving Roadhouse saying, I'm so disappointed by that. Like, I don't expect that to happen. I like, think that is impossible. It, it couldn't happen. Especially because, like, you know, I, I love a good, like, heroic power fantasy, which uh, it feels like that's what Roadhouse offers. Is that is that an apt description? A power fantasy? Like, uh, oh, I man. I don't think it. I don't think it quite gets there. I mean, just like good guys doing good guy things kicking ass? Yes. Uh, it does do that, but I don't think... But that's that's part, like... part of the point is that he is... Uh, people often uh, underestimate him. Yes. I think maybe we have different definitions of power fantasy. Okay, fair enough. I think for me, power fantasy is... Uh, getting to level 20 in the Destiny Islands and then playing the game. Uh, no, see, me for me, power <laughs> fantasy is like any time you get sort of like that heroic catharsis in a film. So, like... Okay, well, then it's definitely that. Yeah, so, like, you know, Rocky, even though he loses at the end, still is a power fantasy. Versus, like, a horror film is the opposite of a power fantasy. It's a powerless fantasy. Yeah. It's just like, oh man, you know, you're leaving Destiny Islands level one. Why didn't you do any battles with Riku? Come on, bro. <laughs> just, you know, all the poor decisions being made. Yeah. <laughs> man, I need to get a PS4 so I can play Kingdom Hearts 3 for that Frozen level. Oh, you, I forgot you still haven't done it. I mean, I... Alright, so people uh, watching this, sign up for my Patreon. Get me some more <laughs> money. <laughs> so I get can this get a... guy a PS4... <laughs> I mean, I will say, Kingdom Hearts three, very fun game. I I expect I would enjoy it quite a bit. Uh, you know, I want to I want to play Final Fantasy fifteen. I want to play the Final Fantasy seven remake. Like, there's a there's a bunch of JRPGs I want to play, and um, you know, a lot of those I can actually play with the wife. Um, yeah, which is basically I, the only I way I play played, RPGs nowadays. I still haven't played uh, seven remake yet, but I anticipate that I will enjoy it. I mean, I've heard. Nothing but good things about it, except from like the most like extreme, extreme section of the fan base. Like they changed anything, I'm just like, yeah. But almost well, yeah. <laughs> and they did change a lot. To be fair, but but I mean honestly, like I'm fine with it. Like the good news about uh, works of ours that like they they still exist. Like 
you know, if you're really pissy about the Heston version of Ben Hur, you can go and download the silent film version if you really want. Like, and if you're pissed about that version, if you're pissed about that version, you can still get the Timur Bekmembetov one that came and went. Uh, you can get the book. <laughs> there's there's a lot of options for consuming stories, and so you're just like, oh, this remake ruined it. Like, I have great news. The other yeah. version still exists, and it's actually cheaper. Congratulations. Yeah, they, they didn't. Um, they didn't take every disc that Final Fantasy original was printed on, and then erase that and put the remake on it. Right. It's not like you know. I understand like some Star Wars fans being pissy, just like we can't watch the original versions of the films, even though you can if you just look on the internet. But it's like, oh, they're not available. <laughs> like, you know, I, I get that. But yeah, like, but, but for, for well, seven for that, it's fans, like for that, it's like get better interests. <laughs> yeah get better interest listen to some rem like a cool person you nerd listen to some rem watch roadhouse <laughs> i like i don't know i don't know what to tell you other than like listen to rem and watch roadhouse if if people get to this part of the episode there really is only a couple of things that can be said and that is listen to rem and watch roadhouse people who listen to this show generally listen to the entire episode i found which is uh, which is well, which is crazy because with the uh, technical glitch, we opened with political talk. Right, uh, but <laughs> somehow the Greg Turin show has gotten very, very political on almost every episode. <laughs> well, these are these are unprecedented times, Greg. Yeah, I mean, this is the first time I can remember when you had like a you know Republican president with a really terrible foreign trade policy running against a corporatist Democrat, like. I can't think of another time this has happened in, in history. <laughs> like not a not a one, and like and like a you know a Republican president you know fighting against civil liberties, you know that's never happened. Yeah, and I can't think of a single time in history where a Republican like exerted federal authority, sending troops where states didn't want them. Like I can't think of a single time a Republican president has ever done that. Like, going all the way back to Lincoln, I can't think of a single time that's ever happened. <laughs> who, who could imagine? Yeah, who, who this could? This really... You know, you know what they say about history. It, it's, um, it happens it's new only every once. time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> so speaking of politics and uh, and terrible things, so you know how like I'm a I'm a diehard Rocky fan, right? I I've heard a thing or two that you've had to say about Rocky. I am actually kind of concerned about uh, Rocky Seven. Have you have you heard about this? Uh, I haven't, and I will admit I have only seen Rocky and Creed. Okay, so know that before we go into this conversation, both of which are great movies. I mean, I would say the. The Rocky franchise is probably the most consistently, like, you know, we talked about this when we did that MCU podcast, where I think the Rocky films are consistently good, but for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And so if you accept that going in and just accept whatever ride each film takes you on, uh, it's a really great series where I would say there's not a bad film in the series, but just like you have to like temper your expectations. We're just like. This one is Which emotional is, drama, and this one is just a fun action movie. But you just have to like accept that as you go through each iteration. Which is how I feel about the REM uh, catalog carry on. I mean, which is, I think, uh, a fair statement. Um, I, I think Monster is the kind of album where, like, if I if I force feed myself it, I'll probably grow to like it. So I would, I would be curious. Um, once you have a handle on kind of their entire discography and then listens to the original version of monster, what you would think of it then? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, REM is one of those bands where I did binge the entire discography in high school. Um, oh, okay. But then just like forgot most of it where it's yeah. like, you know, you're doing like, I need to check out this band for research and then certain stuff sticks out to you. So when I said I hadn't heard monster before I, I did, but forgot it. So like yeah. it's it's it wasn't strong enough to like make an impression. We're just like okay, I listened to this to say that I listened to it and put it on the list to be like yes, I've heard this album. But like you know, if you don't remember it, it doesn't really count at that point. Right. Um, but I would say what was I? Oh yeah. So uh, 
the the Rocky versus splitting into like a, a MCU kind of universe thing where Rocky is going to have Which his always own goes adventures. great. Yeah, and Creed is going to have his own adventures. They're splitting off. Um and Rocky 7 is about Rocky uh taking in a illegal immigrant from Mexico uh like who wants to be a boxer and taking him under his wing. But uh and it's like about the moral question, like, you know, should you take in the homeless person? But what if the homeless person is dangerous? And, you know, Rocky learns a lesson and ends up with a battle on the other side of the border. And so here's the thing. Rocky is like Stallone's ultimate character of like goodwill. Where just like right. through all the movies, Rocky is just so damn lovable. And you just root for him no matter what, because he's just like such a good guy. And Stallone is, he's, like, conservative, but, like, not a dick about it. Where, like, on Blackout Tuesday, he posted the black square and said Black Lives Matter. So, like, you know, he's he's a right-leaning guy, but he's not, like, um, he's not, like, crazy. He's, like, you know, slightly conservative. He's like, I'm an old, rich, white guy. I want less taxes. Like, well, yeah, of course <laughs> you do. Um, <laughs> but I I feel like he runs the risk with this of like going just enough over the edge where he like could spoil the Rocky goodwill if he makes he, this he might turn into he might turn into Clint Eastwood right and <laughs> the thing is one thing I as a guy who's watched a lot of Stallone movies I've learned to not underestimate Stallone because he typically pulls through and typically ends up doing a good job um, through like his different eras and is a good writer but when I like heard the pitch I'm like Yo, dog. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And plus, you already you already did like the sort of like Rocky takes on a protege twice, and one of the times he was an asshole. Like you already did that with Rocky Five, and then the other times, like, but what if he wasn't an asshole? And that that was Creed. So I was like, <laughs> but what if he was an asshole and Mexican? <laughs> like, <laughs> like I don't. This can only go well. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if this is the. But, you know, if if he has a good story to tell, like, that's what I'm concerned with. Like, if he just, like, I have a good story to tell, and I think this is the way to tell it, I'm I'm interested in it because it just sounds, like, off the wall and bananas. Um, so I'm definitely, like, if it's just, if it's a good story, I'm open to it. At any point in this film, do you think that in training this new protege, he's going to tell him that you got to, like, build your wall? You got to build your wall in front of your face. (laughs) Ah, jeez. You know what? Probably. (laughs) Uh, I don't. I don't know. I just like whether that's played straight or not. Do you think that's going to happen? I I have no idea. The thing is, like, because Stallone is a smart guy, but I don't know, like. When, when I first heard about the script, like, I didn't, um, I actually thought it sounded cool, but then, like, I read another interview today, and I thought about it some more, like, man, this could be, like, the film that, like, trashes the legacy of Rocky as a character, if just, like, <laughs> if Rocky ends up being an asshole. But I feel like the arc of the movie pretty much has to be, Rocky tries to be nice, Rocky's kindness is taken advantage of, Rocky has to make a hard decision. But whether or not, like, it comes across, like, well to the audience is going to be a different story. Where, like, I think he's going to make Rocky come out as a sympathetic character, but they might look at this and, like, you still own, you're kind of an asshole for writing this. And I love Sly, so that's, like, I just, I'm really wondering how this goes, and I'm so desperately wanting it to be made so I can see it, because it's just, it sounds fascinating. Well, and that outline you just laid out, like, Minus Rocky, like that kind of abstract thing you just laid out is essentially the plot of Roadhouse. Nice, nice. So so that's good. That's I mean, off to a great start. I mean, I want to see Roadhouse. And I mean, I think you um, heard on one of our episodes because you've caught up with the Lipstick panel at this point, right? Listening to episodes. Um, Actually, no, I'm I'm still quite behind. Uh, I'm trying to think of the last. Oh, the last one I actually listened to was a uh, Rock and Pod uh recap so uh which, which year was that uh i don't remember it was um probably the, the second one then it might it was have the been one where yeah. we played 
Yes, it yes. opened with you guys uh, on stage. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, that was a uh, that was a that was a fun little event. <laughs> well, and it had it also had you uh, talking to Dave Ellison, which uh, to bring that back. Oh right, which I'm doing now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and once again, like I I I'm getting so I get trolled a lot nowadays. We're like I did a I did a striper reaction. Uh, maybe like a month or so back, and I commented how I opened for Michael Sweet. And then there were people in the comments saying, he's a liar. He didn't open for Michael Sweet. There's no proof of him opening for Michael Sweet. <laughs> and then other people in the comments were like posting like articles about how I opened for Michael Sweet and like <laughs> showing. And he's like, you know, show me film footage of you opening for Michael Sweet. And so then I posted a link. <laughs> <laughs> And I know there's also going to be people who just, like, don't believe that I opened for Dave Ellison either. And yeah. it's just like, and I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I did. It's a thing. <laughs> but there's like, no, that just, it's, you're a liar. Ah, I, I, like, like, facts are not, are no longer a thing that work they, anymore. Well, even though they don't care about your feelings. Right. Even though facts don't care about your feelings, like, you try to just use facts with people and they're just like they don't accept them and i just i don't know how to deal with humans anymore i'm gonna i'm gonna which i guess is what taxi driver was about so really taxi driver was just a story of this is turning everything upside down for greg everything (laughs) taxi driver was just about how twitter would eventually be it was seen into the future (laughs) he he you know, Travis, he's just an egg. An egg. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I don't I don't know how, like, you, we can even, like, deal with people. We're just, like, we can't even agree on objective reality anymore. Like, I don't, I don't know how to work with people when just, like, we can't agree on just, like, facts and things that are, are real and have happened that you can prove and cite. Like, how is society supposed to function? <laughs> well, it's going great so far. <laughs> but, like, um, can you, like, imagine, like, how trolled uh, you would be in that exact same situation? Where just, like, people are just, like, insisting something about you and just, like, you know that's not the case and can easily prove it? <laughs> Like I, yeah, I, I guess I guess people just don't know enough about me. <laughs> that, I, that, th- this doesn't happen that often right. for me. But that is, I mean, you have like genuine cool things like opening for Michael Sweet or Dave Ellison. I mean, you have cool <laughs> things. You have plenty of cool things, man. You got that. I've, I've been on the lipstick panel. <laughs> I mean, I think that um, you are a very talented musician. I think you're very funny and could excel at stand-up comedy if you like put together a good routine. Um, you've got like a, a great voice both for singing and for like radio. So like if you were to set up a show for yourself, I think you would excel at it just because you have a very pleasing voice. Like I, me, I've got like this annoying high pitched nasal voice. Um, but just like I happen to be witty and have good commentary. So people stick around, but like you actually have like something that's pleasant to the ears to listen to. Greg, I just, I, only squander my gifts to piss you off. <laughs> I think to myself, if I had Victor's <laughs> gifts, I would be successful, <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> if I had arms that worked properly and could play guitar for more than three minutes without feeling injured and in pain, <laughs> if I Maybe didn't I have would practice, <laughs> yeah, I which mean, I also don't do. <laughs> I, I mean, I do, I do practice, um, but it's mainly. I mainly just keep up on just like enough theory chops where I, if I want to write a song, I can write a song. But like, yeah. there, there's not as much. There's not as much point in me like practicing guitar because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do a gig with that. Not for right. anything other than Snake Mob. But you know, I'll practice bass. <laughs> but yeah, there's there's really not like for me, music is just at this point like another tool for however I want to express storytelling. So, yeah, tangents, tangents and free form. Fair enough. I, uh, but no, that, that's all, uh, 
very nice of you to say, and I appreciate it. <laughs> I mean, look, like, and you know, like, I'm sometimes brutally honest, so you know, <laughs> you know that if I had like, um, well, yeah, I gave you, I gave you an advanced copy of Re Reveal to listen to, right? <laughs> but like, I mean, you, you know, you know me, you know that I have no problem like telling people to their face what I really think. <laughs> Unless I know that they can't handle it. Uh, right. But, I mean, I know, like, you and I... I think you and I just, like, are generally self-aware about, like, where we stand, our level of talent, and what we can do. Uh, I'm, I'm still figuring that out a little bit. <laughs> just because I kind of uh, slacked off for a few years there, so I don't, ac- I don't actually know. <laughs> oh. and, then, and then the world ended when I was going to really start giving it a go. I mean, but... So what what were you planning on doing before COVID hit? Like realistically. So I was um, beginning the process of uh, getting some gear so that I could do kind of a one man show live. Okay. Which I can still start accumulating that gear, except that I'm not getting as many hours at work now, so I don't have as much money to throw around. Luckily, I am on Patreon making just unreal sums of <laughs> untaxed money. <laughs> Just essentially gold <laughs> being laundered over borders. Um, but, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, Epstein's finances are easier to track than yours, man. It's just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, where's all this money flowing in from? It's it's difficult to say, and I, I won't tell. <laughs> uh, so I still want to do that, and I'm... Still working on accumulating that gear, although a little more slowly, just because I would rather eat right now. Are you sure you'd rather eat? You look skinny as fuck, dude. I know. Well, <laughs> thank thank you. I, I I can't verify this, but I feel like I've always looked exactly like this my entire life. You're like you're like a toothpick, dude. I'm really not. <laughs> right, look, stand up. Let me see. I just I just wear big shirts. Um, all right, that's, um, I don't know, you, 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 you look, you look pretty st- slim and trim. You, you look I'm, like you're in fighting shape. See, I, you say that, and I'm not going to take off my shirt, but if <laughs> I did, you would be like, oh, no, you're like probably what the average American looks like. <laughs> I mean, um, that's kind of where I'm at right now because, um, you know, I was going through my fat Elvis phase, um. And so now I'm like, which uh, is that's a good thing to have early on in your career. It's good. It's just good get to get out, out of the way. way. Get it out of the way. Just get that out of the way. <laughs> I mean, look, Elvis had a fat Elvis phase. John Lennon had a fat Elvis phase. Um, Vince Neil is in his fat Elvis phase. Uh, so really, I'm just following in the footsteps of greatness and Vince Neil. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I've um. I've lost a lot of weight since COVID started, uh, actually, because I've been just working out a lot more. Um, so, like, just, you know, getting back into shape, feeling good about myself. Um, and, like, now I'm at the point where I'm not quite back to, like, where I was in, in the best shape of my life. But I'm um, maybe close to, like, high school, Greg, where just, like, a little bit of gut pudge, but, like, not much. And so... Probably after a couple more weeks, I'll be back to where I was when I was in the best shape I was ever in. Mm. And then after that, um, it's more, that's going to be more maintaining because I don't want to lose too much weight and become unhealthy. So I'm like really right. like tracking calories and um, working out like very diligently like for certain times of the day to make sure I meet that criteria. So uh, are you are you like doing like the exercise stuff? Oh, not at all. <laughs> the The difference being, though, I do have a job where I'm standing up all day. Right. And I'm like walking around and lifting stuff. And I can do that for nine hours a couple of days in a row. And it's not really a problem. Yeah. As long as you're able to do that. Because that like, my job is work from home, sitting on a computer all day, bothering people about health insurance. <laughs> One of the great professions of our time. One of the great professions of our time. Well, no, I don't bother... <laughs> It's like I'm working for, you know, I'm working nine hour days and I'll make like 15 phone calls during that nine hour period. Okay. And then the rest of it is um, 
like listening to music and podcasts and responding to the comments on the YouTube channel. Living the dream, listening to the new James Game Boy album on Bandcamp. <laughs> the new EP. The new which EP. Which I will say, um, we didn't talk about it much before uh, before the recording actually kicked off. Um, and uh, obviously you're allowed to be brutally honest to my face live on the air. Right. Uh, didn't didn't receive any immediate praise in the way that the previous one did, which is also completely fine. But what did you think of it? Uh, I, I thought it definitely sounded like something you did in a day. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that um, I, I sensed like some pitch issues and the writing wasn't that strong, so I wasn't that into it. <laughs> That's fair enough. So uh, it's just like I... I think it would have been better to just like do a strong single in a day than to release a like mediocre EP in a day. Um, <laughs> but also, I only listened to it once, um, so I'd have to go back and listen to it. But in terms of uh, your collective work, you know, it kind of fell in the same place Monster did for me. Sure. But I mean, like, look, I like a lot of your stuff, and I know there's some of my stuff that you don't like. So I mean, whatever. That's how <laughs> that's how it rolls. Like, that's how it goes. And I think just the, um, like, you're one of the people who I feel I can be comfortable talking honestly about your art with, because I think you, any criticism I give is probably criticism you've, like, thought yourself and thought, oh, that's fair. Yeah. So, like, you're just like, oh, you sound a little pitchy on that track, and then you go back and listen to it, like, oh, okay, yeah, there is some pitch issues. And also, well, like, also... I, I'm very pitchy, so, like, you know, you have to remember, like, oh, that guy, who gives a shit what he thinks? Talking about <laughs> pitch issues. I've heard you saying I want I mean, the world to know. Wh- whether whether you're pitchy or not, it's like you can hear. Right. <laughs> I, um, well, no, the only I, people who have made great art deserve to criticize art. Well, and that is fair enough because <laughs> then then I could just hear – then I would just hear like way fewer takes about stuff generally, which would <laughs> honestly be really nice. No, I love if, that like, every random guy on the internet is um, given equal <laughs> footing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I will say one of the things that kind of made me laugh in retrospect having made the EP like I got it done with like 10 minutes to spare that Friday <laughs> and I was like oh I spent half of this time on the first track and then rushed through the last three I think I did the last one in about an hour <laughs> and then the one before that was about maybe maybe two, and the one before that was maybe three. Yeah, in fairness, in the- I really need to go back and listen to it, because I only listened to it once, and it just wasn't doing it for me, and I was, like, while well, multitasking. So yeah. it's I don't want to, like, write it off as immediately as that, because, you know, some stuff needs to grow on you. Um, yeah, so, like Monster. Yeah, like Monster. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's definitely a chance for it to grow on me and um, for me to appreciate it more, but... Based upon like other stuff of yours, where I've pretty much liked it right away, or like recognized like the quality and the craft right away. Um, once again, this very much felt like I need to just rush this out so I have something out today. <laughs> and it, just, <laughs> it, it very much felt like that. And um, like, don't get me wrong, I like I admire the go get 'em attitude, but I'm just like, eh, didn't do it for me. <laughs> I I think at the very least it was kind of like. Okay, well, I can do this if I have to, so maybe I should start doing it again. Right. <laughs> well, but it's uh, like I sort of have like that same thing when I'm looking back at the film score, where uh, when I did it, I felt good about it, and then I listened back to some of these tracks, and I'm just like, man, this is like too simple and boring. And then I remember I had like three weekends to do it uh, while working full time, so like I I had like you know six days or whatever to do this. Never mind, I don't feel as bad about it being that simple. <laughs> um, but, you know, by that same token, it's like, um, I would have liked to have done more with it. Like, taking the time and, like, you know, flesh out the stuff and really make it killer. Um, but, you know, we had the, the deadlines to get it done so it could be submitted to film festivals and then wasn't actually submitted to those film festivals anyway because it wasn't done. <laughs> But <laughs> I got film festivals generally stopped happening for right, the most part. Right. But hey, I got I got my stuff turned in like, you know, two weeks early. So like I I knocked out that score. But um you know, when you're like when you're rushing a project like that, you know, you don't really have time to second guess yourself. Um, exactly, yeah. 
I enjoy... Uh, I think second guessing is good, because most of us, when we just rush stuff out there, it's not very good, and that's why people do take the time to, like, edit and second <laughs> guess. Like, I think, like, there, there, don't get me wrong, there are, like, sometimes, like, people who can just, like, rush out stuff and knock it out of the park. Um, but there's a reason why editing is a thing. There's a reason why novelists, like, when they write a novel, they go back and proofread it, and they have an editor, because it's, it's just better that way. And, you know, like, the, the Game of Thrones songs we did, those are, like, the least enthusiastic songs I have in our catalog, where I'm just, like, <laughs> I, I don't resonate with them, like, I don't connect with them. Yeah. Like, I, well, think, I think Drogon Coming is, like, kind of a good song, but all the rest of them, it just, like, it doesn't even feel like I wrote them or had anything to do with them. It's just, like, what are these even? Like, I, it, I, I think don't have oddly any connection enough, to them. The one that, because you didn't do, you didn't work on the first one, did you? No, I did. You did. Okay, because I think the, the, uh, it was a guard, it was some random unnamed guard. I think that is a great song. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was, uh, I think we called it Death Pool, was what we call that one. See, I don't even know the names of those songs. <laughs> I don't how, either. That's how disconnected I... I am from my own catalog. Well, like, but, like, that's how foreign those songs are to me, where, we're, like, we just rush them out so quickly. Um, the, the, basically, the way that it was with, uh, that one, I, I was sick that week, so okay. I helped write the lyrics and melody, uh, but then I let Steve record it. And then the second one I was out of town for and, like, texted Steve some notes on, like, what <laughs> to do with it. Um, as, like, hey, I think you should do this and this and this because I was out of town. But then, um, you know, all the other ones I was fully present for, but still, like, it just didn't resonate. But, yeah, no, I, I did, like, have a big hand in at least writing um, the first one. Um, I, so, yeah, because I think that's a that's a genuine uh, lipstick classic with a capital l <laughs> yeah i don't know it's like <laughs> th those those songs like don't really do much for me um and like you know like when you talk to like when you hear interviews with artists and you're just like what how can they not love this album of theirs that i like like when yeah. you know kiss rags on the elder like how do you not realize how great the elder is you guys <laughs> um like, that's kind of, how, like, until, like, I had that happen myself as an artist, where I look at Lipstick 1, and I'm like, yes, I'm super into these songs, I think they're great. Lipstick 2, even though it um, sold a lot less, still super into those songs, think they're great. Um, and then, like, the Game of Thrones songs, which I've had some people say those are our only good songs. Um, <laughs> and those are the ones where I'm just like, I don't connect with these at all, except for Drogon Coming. That one I connect with um a little bit not as much well, the songs I... from the first two albums but i think um uh more than any of the other game of thrones songs definitely let's let's see i'm now i'm looking at my uh my ranking of every lipstick song <laughs> oh i think drogon coming for me just missed the uh if i was putting together a a a compilation of all lipstick songs that i think are at least like above average good i think it just misses that for me ah uh, i would say if i were to put together like a compilation cd i might stick drogon coming on there like if i think i i think if from from your perspective i think that's worth doing i i think personally for me if i was throwing together 15 songs and i was like these are my favorite lipstick songs it's number 16 I, and I, 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 to, I, to, I totally get that. But if I'm thinking of, um, cause you know, we, every now and then, like we still get asked about like putting our stuff on vinyl and like, cause fans mm -hmm. will still ask us like, Hey, when are you going to put your stuff on vinyl so I can buy it? And the, and you're feel like when I have a thousand dollars to throw around. Well, it's, it's always like the numbers are always like the number of sales that we predict we'd make are always like just enough for it to not be worth it. Yeah. And it's like, because like, we would sell. They would move. But, like, they wouldn't move enough to justify the cost of producing them. And that's where it's, like, really annoying. Because, like, I know we would sell a lot of copies, but not enough to make back the money. And it's, yeah. so, it's so freaking annoying. But um, if we were to do that, I feel like the best solution would be a compilation album of, like, the harder-edge songs that the fans are into. 
So mostly stuff from the first album. The more well-received songs with the second album maybe Drogon coming if we were to do a vinyl, like, greatest hits. Um, because the first album is, I think, just long enough where you couldn't fit it on a single vinyl. And I'm not about to do a double vinyl of the first album. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then again, you know, the first album is the one that sold well enough for a special edition. So maybe, like, it would all of a sudden be like, oh, man, lipstick's cool again. <laughs> man, the economics of the music industry. Can you relate, bud? I uh, I can't. I have so much money. Uh, it's true. You and all that sweet, sweet <laughs> Patreon cash. Please, people, support my Patreon so I can catch up with Victor over here. <laughs> um, I at this point, I kind of know it's uh, it's the same as if I'd bought a boat. It's essentially a hole that I throw money in. Ah, ah, yeah. Uh, that's. Um, but it's more fun for me because I uh, boating is it's OK, but it's not my choice activity. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's just that's the main analogy that I hear people saying of like, oh, like if you want to just spend a lot of money on something, you can't use that much. You ever thought about buying a boat? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I think just um, I don't know. I think you're doing music uh, the right way because you don't rely upon other people. Like, that is, I think, the greatest difficulty of being a musician is when you have to rely on other musicians, and most musicians are shitheads. Yeah, well, it, which is part of, honestly, um, coming on the lipstick panel and then talking to a bunch of musicians, especially ones who are in bands, I'm now like, damn, I haven't done that since high school, and I kind of miss it. I just, I know the instant that we set up a thing and then somebody didn't show up or somebody forgot, then I'd be like, oh, that's right, that's why. <laughs> that's, that's why. why. <laughs> That's why I had to learn how to do everything <laughs> because some people don't do their thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I mean, there's, you know, sort of, um, it's a double edged sword with me, like shifting into writing and working on that. Cause that is a, a solitary process you can do on your own and you can get a lot done and there's no one dragging you down in that context. But I'm also a very social person. I'm also, like, super friendly and want to talk with my friends. And so it's balancing out, like, I have all the shit I need to do, but I still want to actually, like, hang out and talk with Victor sometimes. Yeah. And it's, um... And that's where the Greg Troyan show comes in. That's where the Greg Troyan show comes in, because if you just, uh, want to talk with your friends, you call it a podcast, and, uh, (laughs) and then it's content. Um, but man, like, Podcast well, luckily, you also you also know a lot of people that people would like to hear from, right? And you know me. I and I, I <laughs> but the thing is, and I think I've told you this before, like just having like the aura of like having stuff going on in prestige makes people like take you way more seriously. Where, <laughs> like, I can book, you know, better name like guests and musicians, uh. And, like, you know, like, because I've done, like, the interviews for Sleaze Rocks and stuff. And, like, I've interviewed, like, some really big musicians. And, like, it's just, like, cold contact. And just, like, if you just, like, have credentials, they're, like, people take you seriously. Like, yeah, I've got this talk show. I, like, you'd be surprised (laughs) the number of people who will respond to you when you say you have a podcast. Right. And A, A notoriously difficult thing to get. Right. It's a notoriously difficult thing to get. It's just, like... I don't know. I'm. I, I find like the um, the ease of which it can be to reach some people sometimes is really fascinating. We're just like the some of the the people you think are out of reach are actually very much within reach. Well, yeah. I mean, part of it is, especially when it comes to musicians, a lot of them are very social, <laughs> right? And that's how it came around. <laughs> That's yeah, true. Well, I think I think musicians, I don't know, it's it's a weird thing where like musicians they want like I think a lot of musicians I know look at people in two ways. They look at them as either fans or friends. And like they don't they want to be on certain sides of that thing. Where like they look at maybe like their big musical heroes and they want to be their friends. And then they look at like other local bands who go to their shows 
And, like, you know, they're networking with, but they're like, I really hope this person, like, stays at the level they're at so they can become my fan and I can, <laughs> and I can get money from them. <laughs> because, you know, that's that weird thing when you're, like, you're building up your network and, like, you know, getting the bigger crowds and stuff and that balance. And it's so hard for me because, like, I try to keep that integrity and have, like, be as authentic as possible all the time. And to, like, if someone approaches me, just approach them as a person and not think of them as, like, a, a fan or friend. Just like, try to just, like, treat everyone well. But then there's also the people who, you know, don't, don't believe that I open for Michael Sweet when I give them proof. So it's hard to treat those people well. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, and I think that was one thing um, we um, talked about when we were doing the Bent Knee episode. Like, I don't know if this is talking out of school, but I mean, uh, you had me and Julia on to review that album because you knew that we kind of already knew Gavin, even if it was just from the podcast. And it was like we weren't going to be weird about it. Right. Well, yeah, because like (laughs) Gavin is in a band that a lot of people know, a lot of people love. And the thing is, like, I have a lot of friends who are bent knee fans who like I won't connect him with because they're weirdos and they're yeah. and, and they're like they're like the obsessive fans and just like the 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 trick is like there's a difference between like enthusiasm and like you can be really enthusiastic about something and know a lot about it and be passionate about it, but like you can be chill like with uh with my interview with Lisa like you know how huge into Frozen I am yeah and like how I did not come off as a creepy fanboy <laughs> right cuz like even though it's a, something that I love, like I have a life and like I have other things going <laughs> on. And so maybe that's the trick is just like, if you have other stuff going on, you know, and like, you know, that like, they're just like a component of your life, but not the entirety of your life. Right. Cause like, you know, there are the well, people who it, like, you know, wake up you... and they think about kiss and that's like, yeah. you know, their entire life revolves around kiss. And then when they talk to Gene and Paul, like they don't want anything to do with them. Cause they're just like, okay, but versus, like, if you talk to them and you're just like, oh, yeah, Kiss, yeah, you guys are pretty good. <laughs> you guys can play. I like that song of yours, uh, <laughs> Read My Body. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like Pour Some Sugar on Me. <laughs> yeah, Pour Some <laughs> you hear, Body You ever on hear me. that one? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, well, and I met Gene and Paul before they were famous. So. Right, so, you know, you, you go way back <laughs> with them. Um... That it's, I, that is interesting. Well, I think part of it is if you have a life that isn't just a hundred percent kiss or a hundred percent star Wars, as the case may be, um, <laughs> shots yeah. were fired. Shots <laughs> were fired with that one, dude. Um, it's like, then when you talk to somebody who is involved with those things, you could potentially talk about something else. Because those people, their life, Paul Stanley's life is not 100% Kiss, which is insane to think about. Right. But it is true. You know, like, Paul Stanley, like, has a lot of stuff going on. It's like, I'm doing these, you know, R&B songs. I was in Phantom of the Opera. I work out a lot. I cook for my family. I'm also trying to spread, like, actual awareness about COVID things and arguing with my stupid, stupid fans. <laughs> <laughs> like, Paul Stanley has stuff going on other than Kiss. Um, but, yeah, you know, people need to... I I feel like, you know... You know, variety is the spice of life. There's so many great things to explore in this life. I mean, the fact that, like, you and I, our friendship is based around mutual love of Final Fantasy is how we met. And we, like, yeah. never actually talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> like, we, we talked about it. We talked about it once kind of early on to get it out of the way. But and it, it was it, like the it was conversation like the of conversation where we're just like, I think the 12 score is kind of boring. I think it's great. Yeah. And that was like it. That was all it was we that, did. and then I was like, I also really like one, and you were like, "Fuck you," and, <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> yeah, but like we 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 haven't actually like really talked about it because we we have enough other things that we can talk about and flow through conversation. And I think if you're just like obsessed with one thing, like I don't know if you can relate to people um, in a way, but. Um, I will say, I am actually really grateful for the new Star Wars movies, because I just realized this. Because the Star Wars fans are so angry at the last couple Star Wars movies, 
like they've given up on being obsessed with Star Wars. <laughs> Because that's I've seen, true. I've I seen, certainly don't hear as much about it as I used to. I've seen so many like lifelong obsessed Star Wars fans saying, "I've I don't have passion for this anymore," and I'm like, <laughs> "Hallelujah!" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they and finally let it go. They Greg. finally let it go. And um, you know, as I'm looking around my room, like I've got a like a crap ton of Frozen merchandise and Dragon Ball Z <laughs> stuff around here, but it's like, e. I think you got to have more than one thing. Yeah, I'm just I'm now I'm now scanning my room for any uh, any uh, various art related to my five interests, and there's there's not there's not much. Oh well, and obviously you can see behind me there's nothing on that wall yet, but <laughs> there's there I promise there's stuff around. I'm not a don't put anything on my wall guy. All right, so I think I think I want to finally do it. Uh, I know we've been talking for an hour and a half, but screw you know, Rogan style. We're gonna keep going. I, Has it only been an hour and a half? It's only been an hour and a <laughs> half. I guess it has, yeah. So, what I want to do is I want to actually talk about Final Fantasy. This is the part where we lose the viewers <laughs> on my channel. This Hell is the, yeah! This is the part. This where is they're... gonna be. This is gonna be a, a bridge too far for them. A yeah. battle on the big bridge. <laughs> a battle on the. Br but we're let's just let's just go through the series, man. Let's just freaking do it. I right. love it. All right, Final Fantasy One, go! Like we're actually doing this. Like the thing that founded our friendship, we're actually making this be a thing. We're gonna make this happen. Um, first Final Fantasy. I uh, emulated the NES version in high school when I was kind of in my oh JRPGs. I'm starting to enjoy this phase, um, and I could not get through it. And then a couple of years ago, I got the Dawn of Souls version for mm -hmm. the Game Boy Advance, and I have since played and beaten that three times um and on my most recent one i did i don't think i matched your time but i got it down to like eight and a half or something um and it's a game i think the thing i like about it is that i can essentially play it like a lot of people have been playing um a lot of like how the roguelike uh genre has really gone absolutely batshit huge in recent years I can kind of play it like an RPG version of that because I basically know where everything is. I know exactly what I need to do. And I um, can now just sort of experiment with the different class mm -hmm. systems in there. And it's kind of just like a fun thing I can knock out over a couple of evenings after work. Yeah. I but mean, I'm not I'm not I'm not going to pretend it's like the best game ever. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think that Final Fantasy one um, has a killer soundtrack. That, that soundtrack is bitchin'. That's a great oh, yeah. soundtrack. Um, and I think a sort of, like, there's some core, like, fundamental ideas that I think are fun uh, conceptually of just, like, picking your party at the beginning of the game and trying the different configurations. Um, and I think there's a couple cool set pieces, but I think... Um, the grindiness and lack of story makes it where it's not actually fun beyond like the idea of thinking of those concepts. And so I was like um, a one and done with it, as you know, where I just the only way I actually beat that game was just trying to speed run it as quickly as possible. Oh, totally. What was my time with that? Like six hours or something like that? Yeah, your your time was crazy good. I don't remember what it was. I think you told me and it's like it was like it was I think it was low sevens. Yeah, it might have is... been like it might have been like uh, it might have been like six fifty eight or something, something yeah. like that. I don't remember exactly. It's recorded on a podcast somewhere because I, I yeah because on the Final Fantasy one episode we did with Joe and Caleb, uh, I talked about my time beating it, um, and you know, and that was the only way I could get through it because like it's so easy to lose interest with that one. Oh, totally. Like you have to be like really committed to playing it. And uh, I think, and also because the linearity is abstract, because it's still a linear game, just a linear game that doesn't tell you where to go. And so yeah. I think that is... Um, Which, the yeah, the first time I did it, it, I think it took me like almost 20 hours. Yeah. Because I would try, I would try as hard as I could to find something, and then eventually I would just give up and look at a guide. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I mean, I did, like, I speed run it with a guide. I'm just like, yeah. this is where you go. So it's not just like I was able to guess my way through a seven-hour speed run. Like, I looked at, like, okay, here's where the next place to go, but then did it, you know, beyond that. Um, yeah. 
but yeah, I, I would say it's uh it's a game that like I wouldn't like recommend to most people. I think you could take like the same idea for a game, uh, of just like different job class configurations and like make a better world to explore that's less grindy which, and better story wise. Which they eventually did. Right. Several so, times. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying like if you want like. If you didn't, if you don't want to have like the job switching that you have in other games, I think there could be a way to make like you're stuck with this configuration, but to make that really interesting, I think there's a way to do it. But I don't think that Final Fantasy One ultimately still succeeds with that, in my opinion. No, totally. It's it's dated in a way that's like it's also just a game where you're the odds of you finding someone who both either likes Final Fantasy or uh enjoys retro gaming who hasn't already played it or doesn't intend to play it right the odds of that are just they so don't exist low. that person isn't a, that doesn't that person only exists in your screenplay uh for yeah. your for your art school project exactly it, it's uh it's almost like a moot point discussing like whether or not it's a game that holds up because it's just like <laughs> it is it is a foundational game it's like undeniable and at the same time, it's so dated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Final Fantasy 2. Um, before we jump to Final Fantasy 2, I need to go to the bathroom, oh, obey the hedgehog, as it were, and refill my water. Is that uh, cool? No, go ahead and do it. So this is going to be my test. I'm not going to edit. I'm just going to keep talking. Oh, I love it. Man, this is going to be like complete Rogan style. Just go. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> ah, shit. So yeah, uh, thank you guys for still watching the Listed panel. Uh, not the Listed panel, the Greg Jorian show. Um, yeah, so for people who don't know too much about Victor, um, uh, yeah, we met through a, um, a podcast, uh, another podcast we were both guests on, uh, Ultima Final Fantasy. And um, we were both uh, guests on the show at different times, and... Um, most of the, they have they have like a they had like a Patreon tier where if you were at a certain level on the Patreon tier you'd get invited for a guest episode where you just would talk about the series, and um, most of the people that they invited on actually like thought were kind of cringeworthy, um, just because like they didn't really have a life outside of video gaming, and um, I was like ah man like it's I think there's, uh, you know, like, I think life in many ways is about balance, um, healthy balance. And so, like, you should involve yourself in different things. Like, I think you should focus on something you want to excel at. So, like, if you want to be, like, a, a martial artist, if you really f hone in and focus on, you know, martial arts as your core life's work, you should do that. But you should also try to read, try to be cultured, you know, maybe focus on one craft, uh, for your life that you have passion for, but, um, you know, in terms of, like, um, you know, stimulating yourself intellectually, I think you should try to diversify, um, uh, and not just limit yourself into a narrow box, so, um, and the fact, like, I could tell right away that, like, Victor was a guy who had a lot of stuff going on outside of just, um, playing Final Fantasy games, and just, he had, like, a really appealing personality. And so I invited him to be on my podcast and said, like, hey, um, I really don't know much about you, but um, you seem like a cool dude. You should be on my show because you seem fun. And uh, we've actually been friends for years uh, since then. Um, and, like, uh, he's, like, sent me albums of his to, um, like, listen to from Mitt's feedback. And and uh, speaking of uh, Victor, he is back. He is back. Hey, there he is. How did the ad reads go? Uh, the ad reads were great. This uh, this episode is brought to you, brought to you by Onnit and ExpressVPN. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, and my, I assume uh, if you talked at all about Final Fantasy two, what you said was it's like if Star Wars was good. Uh, I I didn't talk about Final Fantasy two. I mainly talked about our history, uh, how we met and ah. such. Um, but yeah, Final Fantasy two is um, yeah, I'd say. I'd say yes. What if Star Wars is good? I think it's um, it's taken that same concept of like it's taken Star Wars, but instead of in outer space, it's in a fantasy setting, um, and instead of it being sort of like or a know, more or a more traditionally fantasy, setting. a more traditional fantasy setting because Star Wars is still really a fantasy more than a sci-fi, um, 
But it's, um, instead of it being like, here's your one chosen hero, it's, um, really making it more of an ensemble, uh, story, which honestly, um, I think it makes it more compelling. Uh, I think, I think, uh, Final Fantasy II has a, a really good cast of characters. Um, I think for the era, it's very well written. Um, I think I would for, agree. I think the remakes, um, are are well scripted and I think the additional story content like the the post game stuff adds a lot to it. And um I'm also doing uh I'm reading the uh the novelization. Uh there's someone on Tumblr who's translating it and I'm actually reading the novelization on my YouTube channel. So there's a I, playlist. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Um <laughs> uh the novelization is actually um um a bit more I mean this in the nicest way, a bit more fantasy novel than I was expecting. Okay. I'm just like, and here are the <laughs> naked maidens that the brave yeah. heroes. I'm just like, ah, geez, like this, this shit. Um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of Final Fantasy II. As someone who like doesn't care as much about gameplay in these video games, Final Fantasy II works for me. That's well, and so I've talked about things that you've said that stuck with me. Uh, something that Steve said that stuck with me was, you don't play games to have a good video game. You play video games to have a bad book. I mean, that is, uh, <laughs> that's fair. Um, but I mean, look, I think, I think, I think the Final Fantasy games are, have a lot of good stories that I think would be good books. Um, it's just, they were made as video it's games. It's just that so, they, yeah. And, and that so, they become bad books. <laughs> well, yeah. Cause any book that says, and then they just worked out for 50 hours. Uh, <laughs> they went and they ran in circles in the woods and kept killing squirrels till they got stronger and then you just like if you devote like you know two hours worth of reading to that part then yeah that's a crappy book but <laughs> if you cut out that stuff um the books are pretty great but i think final fantasy 2 um i think it's great i love it um i don't have animosity towards it that a lot of final fantasy fans have um it's not one of my favorites but i enjoyed my playthrough of it and i would play it again and i think the mechanic is interesting enough and the version that i have is playable enough that uh i yeah i think that's it's a fine game that's like maybe it's just not like they made it in like what it was like 10 months or something yeah. which is shocking it's great especially considering it's sort of their uh uh their uh trials tribulations triumph by james game boy sort of square enix was kind of going off that that theory of uh of game development at the time they really took a cue from me which is just another way that i've impacted the entertainment industry in all my years right um it's yeah, it's just not it's not one of my favorites, but I don't really have any ill will towards it because I did have fun playing it pretty much the entire time. Yeah. And I think the, it had all of the side characters in it are great. I, I agree. And I would say the way that I play it is like I do all my grinding at the very beginning of the game. So that's I what just, I did, too. And then after that, it's just like, OK, everyone's a god. And then you just plow through the rest and then it's fine. Like if you were yeah. if you were to play it as intended, I could understand being like, I hate this game. But the fact that you can make everyone gods at the very beginning of the game if you just game the system and then just play through the rest and then it's not that bad. Like, I would say just, like, listen to a couple podcasts, make everyone gods at the very beginning, yeah. and, and then just play the game like normal and it's fine. But I, I, I do understand, like, from a mechanical standpoint, it is broken. The encounter rate <laughs> is way too high. But... I'm that not makes playing... grinding easy. Right. <laughs> But as someone who doesn't care about um, gameplay, that's why two ranks so high. Um, <laughs> three. Um, I think three has a lot more charm than people give it credit for. And I think for a NES title, that game is insanely good. Um, like, in terms of its, like, overall presentation on the NES, like, the, the fact that, like, it's not as brutally grindy, uh, the music is great, the switching of jobs is really robust... Uh, and it just, like, it moves at a snappy pace. Like, it doesn't really drag. Um, and also, it does have, I think, one of the best, like, mind-blower moments in terms of, like, the map size. That where, part's great. Where you think the entire game is just, 
like you think you know the world map and that's just one continent. What you thought was the entire world was just one continent. I thought that was actually really well done. Um, the last dungeon is ridiculous and stupid. <laughs> uh, like that is that is a that is a bullshit final dungeon. Um, but otherwise, I would say it's very very solid, and I think the remake also uh, has a lot of charm too. Uh, this is my least favorite Final Fantasy game. Uh, I've only played the remake. I don't like the art style of the remake at all. And I kind of like what they did with trying to, um, add a little bit of character to them, but that the, to the characters themselves, but they drop it pretty quick. Um, yeah, they, they do. They bring it back in awkward times. Yeah. We're just like, oh man, I have such a relationship with this prince. Do you? Why? Yeah. <laughs> you just met. Why why are you two like buddy buddy? Just cause? <laughs> um I I think the job switching thing is interesting, but it does have the annoying thing where it takes like a couple of battles for it to like actually kick in all the way, which I hate. And it's basically a game that like it's just there's a game later on that is very similar that's just better in every way for me. I think that's <laughs> fair. Um, but what I'll say as I've, like, re you know, reflected upon the series, I can see that if someone, like, played the series from the beginning or 3 was one of the first ones they played, the fact that 3 was a NES game that wasn't broken as fuck is probably oh, totally. why, why people love it. Because in Japan, it's, like, really well regarded as, like, one of the classics of the series. Yeah, well, and it's, like, brutal. It's it's not that brutal though, I think. Three, well, it w wasn't the original version, like. No, rough. It's, it's not. It's really not oh, that not. bad. The thing is, that's what's noticeable about because I played um, when I started three with my wife, I played the NES version of three side by side to compare and see how different they were. Aside from like additional characterization and like rearranging some of the events at the beginning, it was pretty much the same, and the difficulty oh. was not bad at all. Okay. Like, it scaled very reasonably. And, like, I played it for a little while uh, to get into it. Um, but it never, like, uh, got to a point where I, it just became too brutal in an unreasonable way. Uh, like, it just it felt very well balanced. And so I think the fact that there was a game that well balanced in that era had to blow people's minds. We're like, yeah. well, you're telling me, like, I don't have to grind a ridiculous amount. The difficulty curve is reasonable. And I can switch <laughs> jobs and the graphics are so cool and the music is great. Like, I could see that blowing people's minds at the time being how good it was. I think if we had a Dawn of Souls style remake of it instead of a pseudo weird 3D chibi boys with big pants version, mm -hmm. maybe I would like it more. Um, but it just that is, I think, the only game in the series that I honestly don't ever intend to play again. Oh, damn. All right, so four. Unless unless my demands are met. Unless your demands are met. What about four, man? <laughs> um, four. So I mentioned earlier that I was I started replaying ten. Four was the other one that I was like maybe gonna replay. Um, I have only I that was another one I emulated early on. I think it was just a little out of reach for me in terms of difficulty and quality because i had just stopped playing six and six is like it's just like kind of the pinnacle of what the super nintendo could do and four is kind of like the opening chapter of what right. the super nintendo can do so i think that was a little bit of a letdown for me um but then i eventually did play the version that's on steam which is the same team that made the three rate the three remake right and that throws me off a bit and it has voice acting which i think is really weird um, but I think the game is pretty undeniable, even if it's not like one of my absolute favorites, it's like, it's a great game. Yeah, no, four is one of my absolute favorites. I played, um, like the first nine, uh, aside, I, aside from three, I played like pretty much simultaneously at a certain point where like I started off with seven and then played eight as a new release and played nine as a new release. And then after those, like, I sort of went back and revisited all the other ones kind of at the same time and played a little bit of each of them. Um, and then um, for me, like, four, four stuck out as being really, really good amongst all those other ones where, like, it's shown above all those other early FFs. 
by a wide margin because I thought the story was so much stronger. Um, the characters, I thought that it was actually a really well balanced game and that the different party setups uh, that you'd be forced to use actually helped you like constantly adjust your strategy. But it also worked really well like in a narrative sense, like every party switch made sense in the story. And I think, yeah, the, they, they built the game around who you have, right. which was really cool. And they also, uh, I think the, the leveling up as simple as it was, it was nice how it's not overcomplicated. We're just like, you level up, you get a new skill specific for that character. Um, I thought that's actually like a pretty good system for leveling up. Like that's probably like the purest level up system you could have. And I know there's yeah. a lot of people who really like the customization, but there's something nice about how streamlined that is. And um, it allows you to focus less on, you know, spending a bunch of time in menus and more stuff about like strategizing in the actual battle and enjoying the narrative and exploration. Because a lot of future games became very menu heavy as you're like, oh, if I want to get this skill, I have to like set up on this skill tree and plan ahead like 30 steps versus, you know, that it's just um, it feels very pure in that way. But I think the the story is top notch uh, as I, I played uh, originally the, the PlayStation version, which is like the brutally hard version. Yeah, uh, but I still thought it was great. And I also recently I played the Steam version also. Um, and I, I do think the Steam version is actually ultimately better. The uh, additions okay. of story, the better translation. Um, it, it's very faithful to the original, but I think just that for me, I'm like a story guy is like my primary reason for playing the game. So like, oh, which one does the story the best? The, th <laughs> the Steam version. And so even though I like the graphical style of the original better. Um, the Steam version does such a good job with the story that I have to lean with that. And I think the sequels for 4 are really, really good. And that 4 has the best, like, expanded universe of all the games in the series. Where, like, I was super skeptical about the 4 sequels. I'm like, they have to suck. There's no way they're good. <laughs> and I just, like, refuse to believe that the 4 sequels would be good. Like, there's no way these are good. And they're, like, pretty much on par with the original. They're, like, maybe, like... There's one that's, um... I would maybe compare them to fr to the the Frozen spinoffs, where um, <laughs> they have like a short like Frozen Fever, where like they, they have a mini game that's only like four hours, and then they have like a full like forty hour sequel. So that's like the Frozen Two, um, but I think like in terms of quality, they're they're pretty close. So I think that entire four expanded universe is great. Well, and even um, that was one thing that was a little surprising to hear Joe and Caleb kind of agree on is they're like, yeah, these games are actually kind of good. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, I was surprised with their assessment of that as well, uh, because I didn't think that they would they would have you know praise towards it, but they did. So, but yeah, I'd say uh, four sequels are great. Five, I think, is um. Well, I had one other thing about oh, four, ahead. which is um, I think it's a great game. It doesn't stick with me personally as much as it does with a lot of people, and. I think may the best chance it has for me of moving up in my personal rankings is if I got my hands on the Game Boy Advance version, I think would probably be the best way for me to play it personally. And, and that version does have a cool feature where you can actually get the old party members and like switch up your final party. So you can, oh, that's cool. So you can actually can like control who your final party is. So that seems like a, a fun feature. Um, five, I think, is... I mean... It's it's it feels like such a cliche to say five has good gameplay and a forgettable story, but like there's a reason why everyone says that because that's the truth. Um, like Ferris is a really awesome character, <laughs> and that is the awesome character in the game. Um, actually, no, Gilgamesh is fun as a as a supporting character. And, yeah, Gilgamesh is a uh, as a series staple. Yeah, my so friend. yeah, Gilgamesh is a series staple. Um, but I think that. Honestly, the story isn't, like, that much stronger than 3's, if I'm being, like, completely honest about it. And so it's just like, okay, it, like, they're pretty comparable, but this job system is slightly more robust, so here's 5. Like, I think um, I do like the, the graphics. I like the color palette. I like the music a lot. Um, you know, I enjoy the set pieces, but I just think it's um, really lackluster in terms of story and character. I could I can see that. I think for me, the set pieces on average 
blow the set pieces of four out of the water. I think you're nuts. I think you're <laughs> absolutely nuts. I think you get, I'll give you battle of the big, big bridge as being a great set piece. Uh, and like, uh, you know, diving underwater as being a great set piece, but yeah, no four has so many great set pieces that I would, I would, I would heavily disagree with you on that. I uh, I also would throw into the mix, uh, when Sildra dies, is a genuine emotional moment for me. And then when you get it back as a summon later is like, I think that is really, really, really strong. No, I, I think that's fair. All right, so now it's going to be my turn. I'm going to adjust some lights real quick. Ooh. So uh, because I don't have overhead lighting in this room, so I'm going to let you talk to the audience for a moment. Um, okay, so <laughs> how's it going? Um I, 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 five is just one of these weird things where I played it at the right time and it's so, it's just exactly right. I think it's, it feels like an old game, but it slightly excels in its, uh, or not slightly, it overachieves in a lot of what RPGs were doing at the time in a way that still feels good to play. Um, if you are a turn-based RPG kind of person. And then on top of that, it does have an underrated story. I don't know if I would ever say it's like the best story, but the story itself I think is solid. I'll maybe hand you that the characters aren't that interesting, save Ferris. Um, but five... It's a good game, and you should play it if you've made it this far in the podcast. I'm pointing at you, and you should play it, the game. It's on Game Boy Advance. That's a good version. Apparently, the Steam version is terrible. Don't play that. Uh, yeah, and then for all you listeners out there, it's about to get – something's about to happen because we're, we're coming up on a uh, – we're coming up on a subject that – I'm back. Uh, Greg, Greg, we're coming up on a subject that uh, uh, has earned you your your probably your most famous nickname at this point. Uh, actually, I don't know if any of my YouTubers know uh, that nickname. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a certain segment of people that call me Hot Take Troyan um, because I defend certain pieces of art and I'm not too hot on other pieces of art. So like, oh man, he doesn't really like Taxi Driver, but he likes Rocky Five. That's hot take Troyan. He's full <laughs> of shit. Um, uh, and so we're talking about Final Fantasy VI right now, um, which I don't think is bad, but I think <laughs> it is incredibly overrated, and I feel like it's... Like, I would call it a masterpiece but I don't think it stands head and shoulders above the crowd the way that a lot of Final Fantasy fans claim it does. And so I feel that what happened with Final Fantasy VI is that there were people in the early days of the internet who were like nerds growing up playing on the Super Nintendo, and they played Final Fantasy III slash VI before it was popular. And then Seven became popular and Final Fantasy became mainstream. And they're like, but you know what? The one we liked before anyone liked it, that was when it was cool. You know, we under, you know, it was like the hipster mentality. We liked it before it was cool. And those were the first guys who were able to become gaming journalists. Like, they got their <laughs> careers in the field because they were older. Like, they were the ones who graduated high school before the Seven fans did. And so they got into all those publications and just flooded the publications with six is the best Final Fantasy. Everybody knows that. And they just like reported it as fact and just kept doing it over and over and over again where like the internet culture accepted that as fact because like if every single game and publication said the same thing, you didn't want to be like the outlier arguing against that. And so this culture built up around six of being by far the best Final Fantasy, no room for discussion, where I feel there's actually a lot of flaws with the game and a lot of room for discussion. I still think it's great, but I think that um, I, I don't think that it necessarily deserves the number one spot, in my opinion. I could see that. That's honestly a very compelling conspiracy theory that you have. 
I mean, I don't think it's so <laughs> um, much a conspiracy theory. Like, I don't think it was like a concerted attempt. I just think that like no, if you look yeah. at like a trend of like what happened. I think that's what happened. That seems reasonable, and especially now because a lot of people that I sort of follow now are very much seven people. Um, I, to me, I would also maybe agree that six doesn't stand head and shoulders above the rest of the series only because the series overall has a pretty insanely high batting average. That's, that's another, Uh, that's another thing. Like I still think (laughs) six is like a masterpiece and one of the best games ever made. But I think to at like six is so far superior to all the other games where it's not even a question, I think is just inherently silly and just built upon, I think that bias of history. And I will admit a big part of six for me was kind of that was the first game I really dove into. And it was like it was one of the only games I had for the Super Nintendo. And uh, mind you, I had a Super Nintendo around the time that the PlayStation 2 had come out. So I was still just doing that. No, I I, I, uh, I get that. I mean, even I remember when uh, all the kids had the PlayStations and I still had a Super Nintendo and I was insistent that the Super Nintendo was great. And I still think it is. I think it has a great catalog of games, but I understand when, like, you're the one guy with the retro system and everyone else has the other cool stuff. I get that, man. Um, And it, I, like, I almost can't even express it. It's just, like, it's such an important game to me, and it is... uh. I like. All right, yeah. so I, here I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little bit of a dick about six. Please uh, do. And uh, I think I have a theory about one reason why six is so popular. Um, so I don't necessarily resonate with Tara's arc, who is arguably the main character of the game. People will say there's not a main character unless you look at all the box art and follow the arc <laughs> of the game. Uh, but there's not a main character. But the actual main character. Um, is, uh, like, her entire arc is, like, how do I people? Yeah, and, which is not your which is not your favorite arc. Right, because I'm just, like... So it's sort of the taxi driver of the Final Fantasy series. <laughs> well, but it's, like, if, if the... But I think it makes sense that, like, gamers who are just, like, bad at socializing <laughs> would be, like, how do I just, like, communicate with people and not come off as, like, a weird, like, creepy asshole? Demigod. <laughs> but... But, like, you know, that's the entire thing. It's just, like, she's bad at communicating, just socially awkward, and just, like, her entire struggle is just, like, how do I, like, show feelings and not frighten people? Um, versus, like, me, who's, like, a socially charming person, doesn't have that issue. And so, if you look at, like, um, 6 versus 7, we'll get into 7 in a moment, but, like, um, 6 is main character, like, her struggles are pretty much how she deals with the external and uh cloud struggles in seven are how he deals with the internal. And so it depends on like, you know, whether or not like you are a person who, you know, is comfortable with the outside or comfortable with the inside. And so I think that uh, as someone who enjoys self-reflection, self-examination and trying to become a better person, uh, Cloud's arc of just, like, examining the self resonates with me more than just, like, man, I'm so bad at talking with these other people around me who just are all having fun. I sure wish I could just, like, do that. And just, like, y- you can. Just, like, just just do it. <laughs> like, that's the solution. Just, like, oh, man, how do I just not come off as an asshole? Just don't be an asshole. There you go. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> Uh, and so I think with uh, six, like I think like the antisocial nerds, I mean, not 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 hashtag not all, but I think the antisocial nerds latched on to <laughs> that aspect of it, just like man, this person's antisocial like me. This is awesome. I that's also a compelling conspiracy theory, and I think that is still something where it's like I don't have like it's certainly not as bad as it was when I was a kid playing the game, but there is still a little bit of like, if I'm not hanging out with people I immediately know pretty well, there is still a lot of calculating I have to do. Uh, yeah, I get that. I get, I mean, I have to do that to a degree too. When you're just in a different social situation, you just have to consider what the proper protocol is. I think that's part of being human, but I think that, um, I don't think that's enough. I don't think that's interesting enough for it to be like the entire core of the game or a core of the main character's arc. Like to me, well, that's a- and that's, that's why they made it one 
fourteenth of <laughs> the game. Right. I mean, it's argue it's arguably more time is spent on her and Celeste than anyone else. Right. Uh, but I think it's she is the main character of the game, but um, uh, protagonist is. Uh, it's the term is diluted by that game because there's just so much going on. Yeah. And I, I do think the, uh, the world of ruin, pa- uh, half, um, does kill the momentum of the game where it just becomes side quest city where yes, each side quest like does add character and story. But, um, I think that the fact that it, it, it for me, just the, it like, it screeches to a halt in that section and the like first number of times I played the game, I would always get to Ru- World of Ruin and get bored and quit the game. And like, I, it took me like you know like six or seven tries of playing the game to actually just beat it. And just with the determination of like, no, I'm beating it this time. <laughs> and I only um, beat it because I was playing it with my wife, and it was just like our bonding thing. I'm just like, all right, let's just do this together. <laughs> well, the thing about it is, it predicted open world gaming to a T right. It's pretty good open world <laughs> gaming, but like that's not necessarily good story wise, but I think that six has, yeah, but that's, that's exactly the issue I have with pretty much every open world game. But I'd say six has, um, uh, you know, some really great characters. I think Locke is a great character. I think that Edgar is a great character. Sabin's a great character. I think, you know, suplex and the ghost train is awesome. I think it's, pl- it's that's, that is a, a, a set piece moment that can contend with anything in the entire series is when you find oh, out yeah. you can suplex the train. Yeah, I mean, that's a great moment. <laughs> uh, I For me, the highlight of the game is the Moogle fight where you get to control multiple parties of Moogles. Um, yeah, that part's pretty great. So, I mean, there's um, there's a lot of great stuff in the game. I think that Kefka is a good villain, uh, but I don't think he's objectively the best villain in the series. And people say, like, oh, Kefka is so much better than everyone else by such a wide margin. I'm like... No, he's good, but you can make arguments for other characters. I think just six annoys me with like the superiority complex. That, uh, that that's for sh- that's that's definitely a thing, and I will uh, I will gladly hand you that. <laughs> like you know, six is a great game. I think it deserves to be considered one of the greatest games of all time. But I think to act like it is so superior to other Final Fantasies and to write off other Final Fantasies that I think are definitely comparable and in some ways arguably better i find to be like as intellectually dishonest as jordan peterson calling frozen feminist propaganda where i'm just (laughs) like it just feels like really lazy and intellectually dishonest and so that's where my annoyance comes in but i think it's a great game yeah that was civil I, I I felt that was pretty civil. Uh, hot take, Troyan. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if any Final Fantasy fans watch this, they're going to be like, oh, man, he's so full of shit. Six is perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. There's not a single thing you can say bad about the game at all. I I think... I both think that's true, but also because a lot of the things that are wrong with it, I think, are funny. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's fair. I think Ultros is great. Uh, Ultros. Th- a part of the game that a lot Ultros, of people hate, I think, is one of the best parts of the game. I think Ultros is hilarious. I think Ultros should be in games as often as Gilgamesh is in. I I fully agree. I think I think Ultros is uh, the most underrated part of Six, and the people who say he's the worst part of Six are the only bad thing in Six. I'm just like, I'm sorry that Six fans don't have a sense of humor. Um, which I think um, our our mutual appreciation of Ultros is actually going to feed in very interestingly to our discussion on the next game uh seven so how is that a feed into uh your opinion on seven ultros so my issue with people who like seven is that they think it's well not with you because i know you do not fall into this camp this is a hashtag not all hashtag Um, all but greg all but greg generally people who are fans of seven uh really take it as this super serious, dark and moody story that is just like constant, like theme and dark and like trying to really understand yourself and the fallibility of memory. But so much of the game is so goofy and so funny and stupid that I like, I can't, I don't know what game those people played. I think that 
the strongest moments of seven in terms of um, like if you're playing the game in your formative years, are those like heavier moments? I think there are a lot of those here there, and I think it's legitimate to remember it in that way. But it's the same way that like people who are six fans cry at the opera scene and then forget that like Ultros is like screwing shit like immediately like thirty <laughs> seconds later. Oh, I've never cried at the opera scene. Right, but like the people who are just like the opera scene is so beautiful, and I'm just like. Why? It's just like this is a scene where the characters are in a play and just like describing something that happened, but that you don't have enough context to relate to the characters that are within the play. And it doesn't. Well, they're doing they're doing a play based on uh, their recollection of the plot of four. Right. Um, <laughs> but I think that um, the the great thing about seven is that ebb and flow. I think like what you know you're saying is like. Um, is why I think Seven is great, because if it was just, like, a, a moody dirge fest, which maybe that, um, like, Advent Children maybe arguably was. Yeah. Like, if it was that the entire game, I don't think it would have been good, but the fact that there is so much comedy, and I think the characters are extremely well-written. So one of the things that I think is a, a benefit of the remake is that they got Cloud's characterization right from, like, all the cutscenes and stuff that I've watched. Um... Because Cloud wasn't just, like, moody emo boy. Like, he had personality and depth, and he was, like, the cocky, cool, confident guy who maybe shouldn't have been as cocky and confident as he was acting. And the fact that they're able to portray that in, you know, the original game and in the remake, like, the characters have nuance, they have depth, they have their darker moments, but they also have their comedic moments... And I think the game has a really good ebb and flow, really good core themes. Uh, I do think that the entire cast is great. I think that Seth Roth is a extremely well-written villain and um, arguably the best villain in the series. And I think that's, I, th and I, I think it's more than just a cool character design. I think the pacing of the story, of how they chose to introduce him, the way that they displayed his power throughout the story to build up, like, the sense of suspense, like the like the shark from Jaws. Like, it wasn't so much scary, you know, that you saw him, but when you didn't see him, and that impending sense of dread. And I think his motivations and arc made sense. Like, I think the characters are really well fleshed out. It's a world that makes sense. And like you know, the goofy stuff, I think, uh, I think works. I think it's just it's it feels like a a, a world that makes sense, that's really enjoyable. Um, you know, great soundtrack. I've and I you know I like the graphics for it. I think there's a charm to it. I think I think it's um it's a very distinct artistic choice. And I think it just there's there's charm to that. Even though it, like they're like oh it looks bad, but like it's stylish. Like it's very distinct. Uh, I would agree. I think one of the things about it kind of from a uh, just sort of a more tangible thing is I have a lot more affection for um, the way six looks than the way seven looks. I also have a lot more affection for the way six sounds than the way seven sounds. And I um, obviously they not... sound basically the same with the same quality of MIDI samples because I <laughs> yeah, it's not them at one it's point. not far off, but I I. I it feels like I think mostly it's the uh, horn sounds in seven that I don't think are very good. Uh, um, that's fair. I, I, I have a, I have an appreciation for it. I think there's a, there's a charm to like the specifics of the horn sound, yeah. but I get how that like, it doesn't work for everybody, but I think that the, uh, the Mel as, as on the lipstick panel podcast, I think the writing is so strong where even if there's some flaws with the execution, I think the writing is so strong. It supersedes the execution. I, and I would for the most part agree there. Um, uh, and it's just like, I didn't really play seven until like four years ago. So that's another one of the main differences. And like, I think with the tone thing, it's like when you read about final fantasy seven, you're basically like a lot of people kind of talk about it as, as if it's sort of this grim dour, like Christopher Nolan movie when it's actually like a Sam Raimi movie. And if people understood this and understood Sam Raimi, then the world would just be so much better. <laughs> See, I it's, don't, I, I don't know if I would call it a Sam Raimi movie entirely. I would think, um, 
you know, I'd say split the difference. I think it's like if you force Sam Raimi and Christopher Nolan to work on something together. <laughs> Which, again, that world would still be very good. Right. It would, it would, yeah. But, I, <laughs> I, but I'm, I'm a big fan of Seven, and I would say it's probably my favorite overall. Um, and I think a lot of it just comes down to, I think, the core arc of Cloud is so good. I think the entire Eris... Eris uh you know sequence i think that's i think she's a great i just think the characters are great and i think the story is so well written um and i think it uh i love the ending i think the ending is absolutely brilliant like it's one of the open-ended endings that i think is actually perfect because it like fits the theme so well like it's not just like yeah. we're being open-ended for the sake of being edgelords like it is the perfect note to end on because you it is questioning the role of humanity in relation to the planet and life and death like that's the theme and so if you just did like uh, a wrap up which is like and here's everyone just hanging out at their houses with their families <laughs> like that wouldn't have been a good ending i think that was the absolute best ending for it and probably my favorite in the series i um would also agree it's like very thematically consistent i just feel like for me the big struggle of cloud not remembering something is not compelling to me in the slightest, but as someone who has <laughs> had like a uh, traumatic events in the past and repressed memories, um, I I'd say it's like, it's legit as hell. So, it, you know, it, de it sort of depends on where you're coming at it with where, uh, you know, I've read articles about like how frozen is really appealing to like people who have like dealt with trauma and PTSD. And so you will hella relate with Elsa if you're, like, a trauma survivor. Okay. Well, then, I mean, that's that's uh, theory proven. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think that Seven is sort of like that same thing. I think a lot of um, media I like is sort of like that, um, like, survivor's mentality of just, like, dive into the core of the issue uh, and then sorting through it. Uh, cause I think Final Fantasy seven does that and frozen also does that. So it's just, it's two stories that like are delving at that same issue, but maybe from, you know, different perspectives. Yeah. Well, yeah. El frozen made the mistake of not literally going into her mind, and right. having different sized, uh, 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 representations of her doing this. Right, <laughs> which I think really, honestly, would have taken the movie to a next to the next level. I mean, you're right. I, but what I would say <laughs> about um, Seven, uh, you know, to address both sides, I think that there are people on the like pro Seven side who take it too seriously and don't acknowledge the silly goofiness of it. And I think there's a lot of people who write off Seven too quickly as just like, oh, that's just overrated, and it's only because the fanboys like it and like aren't addressing the, like the brilliant things that game contains. Oh, totally. And then it's like, I think had I played it as a child, it would be like up there for me as as it stands now. It's upper half just because the sheer quality of it is undeniable from a like even if the graphics and like sound samples haven't held up, it is still legitimately even if you play the PS1 version, which I did a couple of years ago, it is still very fun and the battle system is really good. And it's uh, it's a well put together game in like both for the time and it still plays pretty well. Oh, yeah. The, the material system is a really great system. The way that you can like combine spells and like those different configurations. I think it's superior to the Esper system in that way because you can like do all the pairings. Um, yeah. So and the limit breaks just a, a really like brilliant gameplay mechanic. Um, yeah. All around excellent. Eight. Um, eight is one that I also came to pr uh, pretty late in my time and I thought it was awesome. <laughs> uh, so I, um, when I first played eight, when I was like young as hell, I thought it was awesome because it was just like, it's like seven, but it, like, it looks better. And he's got like a leather jacket and it looks <laughs> intense. And like, it's, I, yeah, it's glam seven. Yeah. I mean, as, as a guy who wears leather jackets all the time, I just thought this is cool as hell. That was before I started wearing leather jackets all the time when I was just a little fatty. Um, it's, it's glam seven. It takes place in high school. Right. Um, so, but w when I got a little bit older and played it, I thought to myself, these characters are so freaking dumb and making the wrong choices at every turn. Oh, man, these are just idiot teenagers. And I was a teenager when I played it, and I hated it. And then I went back and played it, like, 
as an adult in my early 20s. And I was like, oh, my God, these are idiot teenagers. This is hilarious. And loved <laughs> yes. <it>. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I um, – uh, I love eight. I think the aesthetic is really great. Like I love the way it looks visually. I love the character designs, the world designs. I think that visual aesthetic is great. I think the music is phenomenal. The samples sound great. Um, yeah. The story is stupid as all hell until like the end of disc three, and then it becomes oh, yeah. amazing. Where <laughs> like once you're in outer space, the story actually is legitimately like really really excellent, on par with the best parts of the series. But you got these... enough. You have to you have to go to outer space for the story to start being grounded and making <laughs> right. <it> sense. <laughs> but <laughs> but like from that point on, like it's uh, a race to the finish line, just pure excellence. With like maybe the best final dungeon in the series. Um, it's just like really it's... really great final boss too. Yeah, like the thing is like that entire ending section is so amazing but the rest of it the game is so ridiculous before it where like you don't take it seriously um but i think the concept of like the laguna flashbacks is really cool um i actually don't think this game was like the right story to do that with i think there might have been another game where that like gameplay conceit might have worked better but um i think laguna is a great character um and uh, i think the um the draw system is fun to break uh, because if you just know what you're doing, you can just turn off random battles, make everyone gods right at the beginning, and, like, make it a boss rush. Um, yeah. And so the people who say, man, you just have to spend, you know, hours drawing from random encounters. Oh, you just don't know how to play the game. That's your problem. Yeah. <laughs> I still did that because I was having a good time. <laughs> but, like, you don't but... need to. Like, you can, you can uh, like, refine resources from, like, tents, get the Kuragas at the start of the game, beat Diablos, uh, tur you know, level him up enough where you can turn off the battles, and then just use draw points. Like, you don't actually need to draw that way. Like, you can streamline the game in such a way where it's really, really fun. Um, and so this one is, like... You know, it's less it less wins for the story aspect, but I think just because I love the aesthetics of it so much, this is one of the ones where I just like I'm more having fun as a video game, and uh, as a, like a campy story, like the way I would watch like um like a Chuck Norris movie, where I'm just like I'm not yeah. viewing it as high art, but I'm having fun. See, and that's that's the thing. I'm glad you said a Chuck Norris movie because um. Irvine. One of these days, one of these days, you're going to watch uh, Roadhouse and you're going to be like, oh, this is if a Chuck Norris movie was written by Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do need to watch Roadhouse. It, it needs to happen. <laughs> um, do you have anything on eight you want to add? I think, honestly, this is the game that you and I the most agree on. <laughs> like I that was completely spot on. <laughs> I think it is. uh I think it's enjoyable to play either way, either as the boss rush or as the kind of the normal way. Um, it it appeals to me in kind of a similar way that five does in that like the character. I mean, I think eight overall has a stronger has stronger character arcs than five, but they're hardly the main draw aside from like the main romance ah, draw. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also think it is kind of a shockingly good representation of of teenage romance too in that he is just such a dipshit for 90 percent of the game time except like unless renoa is not there and then he's like oh my god she's the love of my life and then when she's <laughs> like i love you he like cannot respond to that at all it's it's very frustrating if you can't view it from a little bit of a, a zoom out lens. <laughs> like in the moment, if you were around that age playing that game, I'm sure that was very frustrating. Oh, but yeah. but um, if being like... mid 20s when I played it, it's just like this is so funny and so great. Yeah. No, I mean, that that game is like. It just has a very special place in my life of just, you know, playing it when I was too young to understand how silly it was, you know, that, like, my change in opinions on it. And the fact that, like, a famous musician borrowed my copy of that for two years, and that just became, <laughs> like, a mini story arc in my life of just, like, getting my copy of Final Fantasy VIII back from him. 
<laughs> like, you know, that that is just um an endlessly like amusing because like that guy has like so many like he's, you know like Gavin uh, probably actually more famous than Gavin, um, but like you know one of those guys who like if someone knew you were friends with him like the kind of guy they'd be jealous of, and I'm just knowing him as like my buddy Scott who just would not give back my copy of Final Fantasy VIII. <laughs> But yeah, uh, Final Fantasy VIII, goofy, fun, um, but I, I definitely give it a thumbs up, and I would say it's still one of the best video games ever made. Um, yeah. I think it's, for me, like, and this is going to hot take Victor, like, there, I think I might like it more than seven. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> from, like, a purely aesthetic perspective, I think eight is my favorite, like, looking game in the series. Just yeah, like, it looks it looks great, like regardless of system, I think. Yeah. So I think just like the overall visual aesthetic of eight, and it, maybe it's because it's just like the main character is wearing a leather jacket and that's just freaking rad. <laughs> um But yeah. Eight, um great game. Yeah, I'm I'm not gonna fight it. Uh nine. Um I think that nine is a great game, and I think that the people who say that six is by far the best game and there's no competition are like really not paying attention to what nine is. Uh, I, I, think, I think that nine yeah. is in my opinion, superior to six in pretty much every way in terms of like, um, skill learning. I think, uh, I like nine's system better. Um, I think in terms of characters, um, nine arguably has, you could argue nine has the best cast in the series pretty easily. Like they're there. It's a top tier cast. And I think especially the starting party, of four is the best starting party in the series in terms of like character dynamics, chemistry, the way the different characters uh, yeah. view each other. Like I'm not going to agree with you a hundred percent on uh, our assessments of nine, but I do agree with that. Yeah. Uh, I think um, there is uh, in terms of like the, the world and exploration, a lot of it does feel a bit empty. Um, so I do understand that where you're so much like, here's another unexplored continent where no one is. So I, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of get some, you know, of the understanding with that, but I think, um, I think Kuja is actually a great villain. Um, I think the the cast is really great all around. I think the music is fantastic, visual design. Uh, I think apart from Zidane, um, who's like visual design throws me off. I think everyone else is actually really well designed, um, and like you know, great characterization and probably like the best dialogue of all the games. Up until arguably twelve, you could argue twelve yeah, has well, better dialogue, but I think nine is um, nine is like actually funny too. Yeah, like <laughs> it has. I think it balances the comedy and drama really well, like tearjerker moments. Like I, I, I really think that nine is excellent. And the one thing I disagree with a lot of people about nine is that they say like, oh, it's just copying all the other games that came before it. I think it's a culmination. I, I don't, but I think it has yeah, its I own don't identity. Think it's, it's it's not doing that very much more than any of the any other of ones. The other games do. Like I think nine very much has its own distinct identity, and so that people who just say like, "Oh, it's just like, uh, you know, I'll copy the other games," I I feel is a really like once again lazy argument for people who aren't. Yeah, it's reductive. Hard. It's yeah, it's not. It's not like that. So I I feel like you probably uh the battles are slow and trance sucks. So yeah, that it's it's like it's legitimately. That's one of the few ones where it has a dated aspect that legitimately makes it less fun to play. And the the battle system is just like I agree. The upgrade system is great and the battle system is a bummer. But um, I think the other thing is, at least for me, I've only played through I've only like really made an honest go at nine twice and I've only beaten it once. But for me. I found that basically what we were saying about eight is it starts, the story starts really being good around the end of disc three mm -hmm. and then it's just great. And I think four or I think nine is exactly the opposite for me at least. Uh, I think the problem with nine as a story in terms of like keeping the momentum going is that it very much feels like, there's two set it almost feels like two separate games in a way where it feels like 
there's the first half of the game, and then there's like the second half of the game is like 9-2, or what feels like it would be a sequel. Because yeah. there's a resolution of a big battle, a big villain is defeated, and then the characters have time where they return to their different lives, they go separate ways, and... Um, there's a lowering of tension, and it, you know the characters are all sort of doing their different things in times of peace, and then it's the reuniting of the party. And so, in in some ways, it's more like a you know an anime after one arc has completed, it moves on to the next arc, or you know like a movie sequel or like a game sequel, or and, like the last third of six, <laughs> or the last third of six. And so I understand how that can be. Um, a, a momentum killer in that it doesn't make you like feel like the same sense of urgency of playing at that point where you're just like, you know, you're like, Oh, I could keep going, but like things feel pretty resolved and I feel pretty comfortable at this point. And so it's easy to like, um, you know, those light comedic beats and the stuff that happens after that to just like not feel like there's that sense of urgency in the plot and you're relaxing a little bit, but I think it's important because there's a lot of important character stuff that happens there, and so I understand it, and I think it's overall really great, but I can understand how that can like slow down the pace for some people. It also does have the kind of the final disc is its uh, main thematic point is not something I find compelling either, which is like, oh, find out who you really are, and are you gonna be that? <laughs> I like. I, I, I think the final discs uh, theme is. I think so much of it is like uh, this is maybe the most shonen of all of them because the mm -hmm. ultimate theme is like power, friendship, no matter what is like the ultimate theme of Final Fantasy IX, which is um, like that entire like sequence where all of Zidane's friends come and cheer him up and say you're a shonen anime main character we're sticking with you. <laughs> like, I freaking cried at that dude. And so the fact that it straight up ends with like him like you know spoilers but also like why are you listening at this point? <laughs> uh, if you're concerned about spoilers, but the fact that it ends with him like rescuing Kuja and being like Goku with Vegeta and like you're still you're still my brother man. Like it's so think, yeah. freaking shonen. I think the the basically everything after you win is great. And then pretty much all of disc four is just like aside from maybe that thing. But even that I didn't really connect to just because I this is I the didn't game, totally buy it. I say this is the game where you definitely felt them running out of budget the most out of all the games. Mm -hmm. where, like, when you go to the four different temples and you're like, oh, oh this God, would be yeah. a really great chance to explore these cool locations. Well, and... that, yeah, that's something they could have done like how Six does a lot of where you split your party up. Yes, uh, and I, I think that's what they wanted to do and they ran out of money. Like, I think that's very clear they ran out of budget. Like, this this is the one that's most clear. Like, they didn't get to finish the game that they wanted. Um and it also there's a few dungeons towards the end that do not feel as like balanced and fair as a lot of the ones up till then do. And uh, the the Makoto character definitely feels like she should have been a party member, but they didn't have time to fully flesh her out. And so, yeah, I, I would say but I would still say even though there's like those things where you're just like, oh, you can tell that there's more that should have been done with it. I still think it's a masterpiece. And like I treat it some ways like like Xenogears where Xenogears is more aggressively unfinished than Final Fantasy IX. <laughs> but that doesn't change the fact that Xenogears is a masterpiece and one of the best stories I've ever experienced. Um, Final Fantasy IX, despite like those minor nitpicks, I think the execution of everything else is so great. The battle speed is a little bit slow and trance is annoying, but otherwise it's the same battle system as all the other games. Um, so Except I that 7 and 8 operate really fast. <laughs> Seven and, and eight operate fast, and I think uh, the limit break system and well, like the limit break system progressively got worse from like yeah. seven onwards. Like seven was like the best, eight was like fine, I can work with this, and then nine is like ah, geez, this sucks. Um, yeah. So, but um, for the stuff that I value, which is like story and characterization, um, I think nine really, really excels at that, and. Um, like I, I find the themes to be compelling 
Uh, for me, it's like it's an absolute home run. And when I first, you know, played nine, I was annoyed with it because, like, man, you know, I they they don't look like the Nomura designs. You know, they don't look all anime. They look all cutesy and kitty. But then, like, as soon as you play it, you're like, no, this is really great. This is a really charming world. The only way it could have been better is uh, if at the end of the game where you have to talk. Because you know how, like, you're walking up to Kuja to talk to him at the final battle. Like, you have to trigger it yeah. by talking to him. Uh, if you could have pressed a square and done a card game with him instead, would it be oh. the only way? <laughs> it would have been a better game. Then it would have, like, I would have had to don my cap or doff my cap, as it were, uh, at that point. That would have been really something. I, w- I would have been okay if they just even add this, like, as a new game plus thing, where, like, you can't yeah. do it the first time because they want you to take the game seriously. But if second time around, you can just challenge him to a card game instead. That That would have been the way to do it. <laughs> also uh beatrix is a great character and i think she's celis done better um i'll give you that as six fan number one i'll give you that well i'm not six fan number one because i do think it has flaws i just right think they they add to it <laughs> uh, uh so 10 um i think 10 is a great game and i think that people rag on it unnecessarily i think uh some of the voice acting is awkward but i think it's charming and fun and distinct and some of the voice acting is legit good like john dimaggio is legit legit good throughout the game oh yeah um i think the battle system is excellent i think the sphere grid is excellent i think the cast is excellent i think it maybe has the most well realized and consistent world in the series we're just like this world building makes a lot of sense um, music's great, and I think the exploration is actually good. I know a lot of people complain about being too linear. It is basically the same amount of linearity as all of the games before it, except there's not a world map. Otherwise, like people are saying, like it's just hallways. The other games were hallways too. Yeah, they were just they had uh, more dead ends. <laughs> right, but they're, they're <laughs> still like they're still branching paths. They're still dead ends, like. The the pathways between the towns were like dungeons to explore, comparable with other yeah. FF dungeons. It's just like you weren't there out was, of world yeah, map. There, you just don't ever leave a town and then go to a dungeon. You just, the second you leave a town, you are in a dungeon, essentially. Yeah, the people who complain about the linearity of 10 and then talk about how 9 was the last true Final Fantasy, like 9 is very linear for a while. We're like, oh, you're on the world map, and the only place you can go is to this next town because everything else is blocked off. And then you're yeah. on an airship. All right, and now you can only go to these different places because everything else is blocked off. Like, right, there's a magical force field or yeah, whatever so, it ended up being. So I, I, think, I don't think 10 is nearly as linear as people complain it is in comparison to the previous entries. I think that's a, that's crap, <laughs> a crap critique of it. Um, also, the summons I, are great. Summons are really great. Switching out party oh, members yeah. at any time is really great. It's super fast battles. I think it's still my favorite summon system. It's the only summon system in a game that I where I actually use it in battle. <laughs> uh, pretty much all the other ones I don't hardly at all. Um, I will say I miss the world map only for aesthetic reasons. I I get that. I like I just I like that thing. I like it's it too. Not and, in the game. and you know, and and eight made it. Uh... Eight still did it. Yeah. It had a largely, it had a very similar aesthetic. I mean, they were going for more like um, like an East Asian island aesthetic, but still like yeah. in terms of the realistic proportions. But um, yeah, I think that ten is just like all around great, great cast, great you know, great story. Like I don't really have that heavy of critiques for it. I think it's just a really well done game and like well paced and conveys its themes and characters well and is still immensely playable yeah um and it it's 10 is one that is um it it vies for the throne i think it's ultimately there is the nostalgia factor of six that is going to be difficult to overcome but i do have a lot of nostalgia for 10 because as i said i got my super nintendo when my friend got a ps2 uh, so I did watch him play 10 right. a fair amount. But um, and, and I think there's something to be said about how often it's ported to every new system and how it sells well every time. It's just yeah. like it's one of those games where like it holds up extremely well. Like it, it looks gorgeous and it plays very well. I think it's very much 
I think it's very much timeless. Yeah. And it does have the thing like unlike seven, I think people accurately remember 10 as being a game that gets very serious, but is insanely goofy. Yeah, I would. <laughs> I would agree with that. Um, I bought 11, but um, it never, like, ran properly. So do you have thoughts on 11? Um, if they ever make a version where I can just play with my friends, I will do it. But I... Um, isn't, I that, am, isn't that what the game is? Yeah, but the, the odds that I could simply run into someone I don't know, I hate that in games. Ah, so just your friends. I would yes. say if they made a single-player version of 11, um, I would definitely want to do that. Yeah, I would. I mean, I would take a single player version first, but having listening listened to all of Joe and Caleb's talk about it, and they say it it really benefits from being a multiplayer experience. I just hate people I don't know so much. That's fair. <laughs> uh, and I, I've I've been watching actually the eleven cutscenes on on YouTube um, because I know that I'm not going to spend the time playing that game. Um, like if I don't have the time to like sit down and watch a two hour movie, uh, I'm not going to spend like thousands of hours playing Final Fantasy XI. Yeah, several several days. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I would say that the um, the story is, you know, probably about as good as you can get with an MMO, um, where like you just you can't really have that great of a main character, um, but yeah. a lot of the supporting characters are good. The music is good and the. Um, the aesthetics are better than I gave it credit for initially. So Ev- 11 is, um, I think, worth investigating. Um, 12. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I think that 12 is like Justice League in that it's kind of boring. Um, <laughs> and that... Uh, like I remember when I got twelve because I was still living in Cleveland. It was before I was moving to Nashville, and I like I had like some months of downtime. Uh, actually, no, it was um, it was after I graduated and was like working on the lipstick album. But I think I had some downtime, so I bought Final Fantasy twelve because I missed it in high school because I was just doing other stuff in high school. Um, so I went and I'm like, man, new Final Fantasy game. This is great. I've never played it. And as soon as I started with that battle system and just like that opening sequence, I'm like, ah, oh, wow. I, I think this might be terrible. Um, <laughs> and so when I played it with my wife, I actually um, had her skip the entire opening sequence and started her off when like Vaughn and Pinello are like in the sewers killing rats is when I like brought her into the room. And I think okay. that that opening sequence is um, honestly, I think, terrible because uh, the battle system, you're so limited at that point of the game that that tutorial um, really annoys you and you think that the game is going to be like a lame auto battle system. Um, yeah. The fact that like... Which it, it's it's a great auto battle system. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get into that. <laughs> uh, but also the fact that like you don't understand anything that's happening. Uh, like there's so much like political jargon and dialogue that's going over your head you don't understand who any of these characters are you're not remembering their names it's just it's too much thrown at you at once and they do a they just like explain all that stuff in cutscenes later and like all it really does is like kind of leave a bad taste in your mouth that intro so i i mean i do think it's cool to have you start off playing as a character and then that character dies and just like isn't in the game anymore but i think you weren't with rex long enough to like really have that impact so it was just like, I think that was just a really bad intro. And then the fact that you're spending hours and hours and hours in the desert at the beginning of the game, which is just like a really boring visual. It's just like, okay, how many hours are we in the desert? Um, a few. Uh, quite a few. Uh, there is some cool places you can go. Uh, I think Balthier is a good character. Um, Bosh... Uh, you know, I, th- I think the characters are okay. I think Balthier is the only one I would say is a really good character. And then everyone else I would just say is okay. Um, I think the translation is solid, but I think it's lacking uh, charm. I think it's a little bit Definitely. too serious and too dry. With the exception, with the exception of Balthier. With the exception of Balthier, which is why he's the character of the center. But like, I think it's a little bit too dry, and it lacks the charm and charisma of basically every other entry before that. And so it feels very Western in, like, the way that, like, um, 
you know, a Western RPG will just have zero charm. It'll just be like, we're all just like really brutal, like burly, tough men. And it's just like, there's, there's no, there's no whimsy. It's like completely serious. Like the way that people think about seven is the way they should probably think about 12. <laughs> and so I think that lack of, um, uh, lack of like charm and fun to it. I mean, they're, they're still fun and there is some charming elements, but it's so far in that, Western fantasy direction that uh, it doesn't hold up for me that way. I think the characters don't have that interesting of arcs or stories. They're like they're not like it's mostly a political plot and a pretty uninteresting political plot. So like and also the fact that it takes place in Evilis and um, I think Evilis was much more interesting than the original tactics. It's like it's just like it basically just failed on every level. And then um, the license board was fine. <laughs> I actually I miss the original license board in uh, in in the the remaster. I wish it was still there, like they did with ten. Um, so twelve, I will agree. I think the first three hours are pretty rough, <laughs> which um, is not a wonderful thing to say about a video game, <laughs> right? But because <laughs> usually that's the best part. But wait till we get to the next one. <laughs> 12, though, I think the way that the battle system rubbed you the wrong way, it is the ideal battle system for me. I love it so much. I play it, could play it endlessly. Um, the way that it works is it's basically... So as I mentioned earlier, I was a film student in college. Um, uh basic run through there's three sections of making a film roughly pre-production production production, and post-production pre-production is where you're dreaming all your dreams and um trying like figuring out all the ways you can make your movie awesome and starting all the scheduling and all that production is where all of those things meet reality and fall apart and crumble um and then post-production is where you try and salvage everything pre-production is amazing because it, it only feels good. And then <laughs> Final Fantasy XII is pre-production the game. And then the battles are production, but you can go back into pre-production in the middle of a battle and fix it. Ah, yeah, it's I mean, so the, good. The way that it is, it's, it's ba- the battle system is largely basic programming where you set your AI characters to perform specific functions based upon different situations. So if... You know, there is an enemy nearby, attack the enemy. Um, If the enemy has this kind of elemental weakness, instead of just doing a basic physical attack, you would do a magic attack and you would place that as the priority. And then you would place above that if a party member falls below this percentage of health, heal that party member. And so it's all programming. I think it's a battle system that I think it works well for the AI if you're having AI-controlled characters. So if you could do something like that in Kingdom Hearts where it's that specific and Donald would actually heal you, it'd be great. Yeah. The problem (laughs) I find is the battles are very slow, very tedious. I'm talking the original version, uh, not the four-time speed version, which obviously fixes a lot of issues. Um, But they're slow, they're tedious. The the animations are very, like, monotonous and boring-looking, so they're lacking sort of that charm. Uh, The music is kind of meandering in the battles because it's just, like, whatever the background music is most of the time. Um, And I think the fact that um, you as the main character can't make your actions in real time, like, you choose attack... And then you have to wait for your bar to fill for that attack to actually work. And so you have to like hang out next to the enemies, enemy. So even though you can free roam, in many ways it's still like a turn-based battle. Versus if you had played Kingdom Hearts right before that, where you had AI-controlled characters and you had the freedom to hack and slash and do whatever you needed to, that slowdown feels like a glacier in terms of just like how slow things are moving, like a glacier melting. And so I think that if you take that same gambit system for the AI but allow the main character to have maybe a little bit more of an action orient in terms of like the speed of things, I would say then 12 would be probably the best gameplay system in the series, uh, having not played the 7 remake. But based upon where it is, it's more painfully slow than 9, and also less interesting to look at than 9, because at least they're doing cool animations. So I would say... 
like, 12 had some good ideas with the AI, but in terms of, like, what the main character does, it just makes it really boring to actually play the battles. I uh, concede every single one of those points, except that I think it's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's nice that we're able to have, like, a very, like, reasonable, nuanced discussion about these things. <laughs> Uh, you know, I feel like the hot take Troy and nickname is just from people who like who don't have the balls to have like interesting opinions. <laughs> just like because I feel like nothing I've said is like really like that radical or off the wall or without justification. I mean, plus you like seven, right? Like, like how much more how much more mainstream of a of an opinion can you have? I, <laughs> a, 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 I don't know. Like, oh, he's such an edge lord. He likes seven. <laughs> um 14 haven't played haven't really watched any of no opinion do you have any um maybe someday but i can't imagine i'll ever have the time yeah uh 15 haven't played watched all the cutscenes. um killer soundtrack yeah yoko she's great. getting it done i hope they bring her back I think she did a great job. I think she's really great. I think she's one of the most skilled uh, composers working today. I think she's excellent. Um, do you have any thoughts on 15 you want to share? Um, 15 has issues. Mainly, I think the big one is... It's an open it, world game? It's an open world game. And I know people pretend to like those, but <laughs> there is a genuine fucking problem with them. And that's the game kind of stops when you get bored instead of when when it's done <laughs> and <laughs> um having gone through 15 once uh i can say it has a little bit of the same problem as eight where the kind of the last little bit is really really good and it your mileage may vary on the stuff leading up to it uh but i think overall it's well acted and it's fun to play and uh, I like a lot of things about it. It's just the open world is both too big, but also not big enough. <laughs> I, and I understand that I've, 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 you know, read a lot of reviews on it, seen a lot of YouTube videos. Um, I think the story as I experienced it seemed very solid, uh, but with, um, could have used some more development of Luna Freya, but yes, definitely. But otherwise seemed pretty like well done overall. Arden seemed like a great villain. The, uh, main He's characters very seemed like they were a really likable uh, and like a well balanced unit. Um, so I'm looking forward to when I play it and I expect to enjoy it, um, but maybe to you know be underwhelmed by the open world aspect of it, but probably enjoy it overall. Um, I, I I think it's interesting because it does kind of the same thing as 12, where there's a whole like side quest where you can do a bunch of hunts. And I think 12s are a lot more fun and cool if you, I mean, I like the battle system. So that. I just, I just realized we completely skipped over 13 by accident, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is ironic because I think 13 is 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 great. I actually like 13 a lot. Um, 13 is just a little too long for me, um, but I think it's a very fun game. And it took me four times of giving a go at it to really to actually beat it. But it is very fun it has challenge to it, but never feels totally unfair. Yeah, no, um, it's, it's it's a game that like it's it's all about getting better at the game. Yeah, and uh, I think that um, the story, I think the music is great, and I think it's really underrated. A lot of people trash on the soundtrack for it, and I don't. Yeah, I get think that it's, it's it's just different. I I think I understand the criticisms of 12's soundtrack, and I just happen to love it because. I like I love the sound of Super Nintendo era MIDI and the PS2 era MIDI. I just for some reason can't quite get into the PS1 era, but like and 12 to me reads more like a movie score, which doesn't work as much when it has to be like atmospheric for 60 hours instead of two. Right. <laughs> um, and then 13s is just like so because it's one of the uh, one of the co-composers of Ten, I believe. Yeah, Hamazu. Um, so you get you get a lot of the stuff that he brought to that, but it's like all that, and the the it fits so I think aesthetically well with the world and characters that are presented. Yeah, I I think that um it's um 
I think it's another strong cast. Uh, you could you can definitely argue an annoying cast, but I think they yes. are they're annoying, but they're well realized, and their arcs make you like them more throughout it. Um, and I think that it's uh, in many ways. It, I feel like it carries on the legacy of other Final Fantasy games more than people give it credit for. Like, it definitely feels like a successor to 7, 8, and 10. Like, it feels like a successor to those Final Fantasy games. Um, versus, I think 12 really feels like maybe the most distinct game in the series. Like, it's really doing its own thing. I think you could maybe argue 8 does that, too. I think that eight feels like a really logical like follow up from seven. Um, yeah, well, and then nine doesn't feel like a f- logical follow up from to but, eight. But but nine feels like a follow up from everything that came before, including eight. Like when you look yeah. at the entirety. Um, but like twelve, like even if you look at it from following eleven, it still feels like it's so western in its approach. On top of like the difference in gameplay style. Um, and exploration, like, so different from everything else. Like, it really feels like it's its own thing, so different. Versus uh, 13, you know, not not to be confused with Versus 13. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like 13, like, really continued, like, the, the melodrama of, like, 8 and just, like, the angst and silliness of 8. Um, totally. But... Plus those Nomura character designs, plus, like, that sort of, like, random battle structure... Uh, I, I do I do think the battle system is really great. I think it's, you know, very snappy and does involve a lot of strategy. Um, in some ways, it's more like a rhythm game um, where you're just like, oh, the, you know, enemy changes its attack pattern. Now I need to change my attack pattern. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a uh, sort of an aggregated version of the way that you could sort of program 12. Yeah, it's like you they everybody has a couple of different modes yeah. and then you can set up. I think I think it's it's very it snappy. It make it's like the battles are very energetic, and so if you were bored by the battles in twelve, uh, I think the energy of the battles in thirteen plus like you have battle music again. Um, yeah, and so I think in those ways it felt like a return to form. But yes, obviously you know the linearity. Like even my wife called it hallway of the game, and she's not. Well, a gamer. I think the problem is so I love another thing that I love about 12 is how much walking around you can do. Like you can do the, you can teleport places, but I just love walking around in video games Mm -hmm. and 13, like even 10 lets you walk around a little bit and 13, they went so hard in like, it's like they almost borderline didn't even cover up the rails you're walking on. Yeah, they they did, so... but uh, but the thing is, as someone who is like enjoying the story and enjoying the battles and enjoying like the visual candy of the scenery, I didn't mind it too much. And the fact that it also still fit with the narrative of the game, where like you're on the run, you don't have time to go back. Like, I understand why it's annoying to like video gamers, but as someone's like, I'm mainly here for the story, so I'm having a good time. I yeah, I think they could have still struck a balance of you can't explore a lot of places and still been like but in every location you're in you can move three feet to the left or the right (laughs) i think they could have accomplished that and i am not entirely certain why they didn't because the places all look really great and you just don't get to see a lot of it that's not that any of the other games really let you see a lot of anything it's just that they were better at fooling you into thinking you did are there any spin-offs in particular you want to address? Do you want to talk about tactics uh, or Chrono Trigger or anything? So um, I had, I think, one more point about 15, which is, uh, despite all my gripes, it's still one of my favorites. Um, yeah. For spin-offs, I actually have not really engaged with hardly any of them except for Chrono Trigger. Um, I Goddamn tried to masterpiece. play... Masterpiece. Yeah, which is just a phenomenal game. Um, yeah, I would say that, you know, there is um, a, a sort of like an age old debate of like Final Fantasy six versus Chrono Trigger. And like I am hard on the Chrono Trigger side of that debate. I'm soft on the six debate and can completely see either side. <laughs> um, I think. Yeah, Chrono Trigger is just it's it's pretty unbelievably good. Uh, like the fact that like it, it's sort of like a grind proof game like if you just do the battles reasonably throughout you don't really need to grind 
The characters are amazing. The music is great. The time travel system is actually brilliant because, like, the way that it weaves throughout the story makes it interesting to go back to the different eras. The side quests at the end of the game are, like, so seamlessly, like, interwoven into it where, like, they're so fun and add so much world building to them. And they are very clearly side content where you don't feel forced into doing it, but you're really excited because, like, each of them has a cool story to it. The fact that you can recruit the main villain, have the main character die, like, all those different options in terms of narrative. You can fight the final boss, like, pretty early on. Right. If you well, want. Yeah, so I think that um, all those things, it just, um, it's really, really... Um, a masterpiece and like you know there's like there's a lot of humor there's tearjerker moments uh it's like really really strong characters like it's it's a home run for me it's a it's a masterpiece it um it's undeniably like in a way that six can't quite claim it's just like a really well put together game <laughs> it yeah. has like practically no flaws it, it re- uh, and like the 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 dual tax and triple tax, like party alignments, uh, like new game plus being just a great feature. Like there's, yeah, there's basically, I don't have a real, I don't have flaws with Chrono Trigger. Um, like unless, yeah, unless you're just like, you don't like <laughs> RPGs at all. Like Steve. Um, right. But like, if you, <laughs> if you're even like slightly okay with the genre, it's a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. It is a, if you are like, God forbid you're a gamer. It's a game you have to play. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, did did you say you had you played Tactics? I started Tactics on my friend my friend's iPad, and it the battle system and the way that it introduces you to it just did not work for me. And I think playing it on on an iPad was a big part of that. I really would much rather play with a controller just like it just makes a lot more sense to me yeah and i i think i would like it it's just at the beginning you feel so powerless and um i was playing on an ipad and i hated it got it yeah i uh i (laughs) tactics is like a top five for me i really love that one um I think it's an absolutely, you know, brilliant in terms of story. And I think the gameplay is really good where it's like, I think maybe that's one reason why I don't care about five is, or I mean, I like five a lot cause I have nostalgia for it. And so like, I have like a lot of nostalgia for like memories of playing five when I was younger and like, it's always going to give me a warm and fuzzy feeling in my heart. But the people who are just like five's gameplay is so good with the job system. I'm like, y'all tactics just did that better. Except, I think five is so snappy and it is a, a version of combat that I am very familiar with mm-hmm. and tactics felt like wading through molasses in comparison. Yeah, I mean, tactics- so I never, I never even got to experience the job thing really because oh, I there's- just, I couldn't. I couldn't play the game. There is so much customization you can do with jobs. Like one of my best characters was like a random, like no name, like, you know, foot soldier I got at the beginning of the game and I made him a gun wielding black mage and um, just he was just so freaking awesome. Where even as I got so like he was like he was Fran and Balthier, yeah, put together. Yes, <laughs> um, but the fact that I got to like even as I got story characters who had better stats initially, that customization I did from him early on made him useful throughout the entire game. But like your characters can experience permadeath in that game. I hate. I also don't like that. That's the thing that does not please me i think i like that for the added sense of tension um i i i can appreciate it as a mechanic i just i when i'm playing a video game i want to well you have the ability have fun, to save them. and like, that's if, not fun. if they get knocked out you just have to go and save them within a number of turns so um i don't know for me it's this the i i think it's another masterpiece um great game are there any other ones you want to do us did you any other spin-offs or anything I don't think I've really I honestly have not engaged in a lot of the spinoffs, mostly because uh, when I hear that word, I think that sounds like shit. <laughs> uh, uh, some of them are. Uh, and and so I and, you know, I, I used you remember that one episode I did where I like I just listed off all the ones that I did. <laughs> that yeah. Massive, massive girthy list. <laughs> 
Um, but I'd uh, say uh, uh, the four sequels are definitely, I'd say those are worth your time. I, I think the only one I'm liable to play anytime soon would be 10-2 and simply because I have it. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, we didn't talk about 10-2. Um, awful story. Uh, the gameplay is good, but uh, I, yeah, I, can't, I, I have trouble going back to that one. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Well, that That's... is that is our episode. Uh, three hours, longest episode of the Greg Troyan Show. Victor <laughs> Krause, who is still here, who is still watching. Yeah. Victor, where can people find you on the Internet? Uh, if you want to hear my um, my newest release, which has only received the, highest uh, the, the most the, the most glowing recommendation from Greg Troy and live. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, my music can be found, uh, under the name James Game Boy at, on Bandcamp, on Spotify. I'll probably put that new thing on Spotify at some point when I get on my ass, as it were, to sit down at the computer and do it. Um, and on Patreon, which I mentioned, and, you know, it's already just a absurd deluge of money every month, but if you felt like adding to it. I yeah. wouldn't be mad. I, I think you, uh, I think you should add to it. All, all you people add to Victor's Patreon. And the thing is, Victor does have a a lot of great music. It's just this latest release like <laughs> didn't work for me. But like I think he's a really talented, great musician. Just like sometimes great musicians that you like sometimes do stuff that you're lukewarm on doesn't mean that they suck. It's just like ah, I wasn't as into that. There's some <laughs> REM sometimes... stuff that he's not as into, and he's like he yeah. loves REM. Doesn't mean REM <laughs> sucks. Just means they did some stuff he wasn't as into. It's just that they sucked in 1996. That's right. all. And it's just that you sucked <laughs> this, you know, last weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just sucked yeah. in 2019. You know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's no big deal. Right. We move it, on. At least you only sucked for a weekend. I sucked for a year, man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you if you go to the the band camp there's like there's other stuff too there's like a couple uh three there's three eps there's uh there's two out al- three albums there's you know there's a lot there's a lot going on there um it, yeah that's <laughs> that's how it that's how it goes all right well victor kraus let's get out of the time loop thank you so much time <laughs> loop i i will knock you all down <laughs>